here in this room, we also have a bunch of people online uh, who are who are watching from the other far flung places in Maine who didn't have weren't able to drive here today. So again, welcome to you online. Um, so I uh, I have a couple of other thank yous, and we're going to have a couple uh, introductory speakers. Um, but I have one big piece of news, which uh, we get to kick it off with and end with. And that is, um, as of today, another round of grants is available to communities. These are $50,000 grants to take climate action. If you're able to work with a neighboring community, you can get 125,000. I know that's hard sometimes in Maine, but working with your neighboring community is also pretty awesome. Um, and if you're a service provider that wants to work with a community in Maine, your the grant program is also open. So uh, we are excited to be able to do this. I will also say that Governor Mills has proposed to double the size of the program in the main state budget. Uh, that budget is still being considered by the legislature. So we are still crossing our fingers that that will get across the finish line uh, by some point before the legislators go home. Um, but I will just say that we have received a ton of bipartisan support, people from both sides of the aisle who recognize the work that you do in communities is the among the most important things we can do to take action on climate. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, at the end of the day, um, Brian will give you the deep details about how to apply for that program, the details of when the funding's available, how to find the RFA, the official thing the state calls grants. Um, so uh, do stay for that. I also wanna just start by thanking all of the other state agencies uh, who are here in the back of the room. I would highly recommend you stop by their tables. Um, from Efficiency Maine to DOT, um, to the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry, Rural Development. These folks are here, I will just say, with other ideas of funding for you. So if you are here to try to figure out how to take action and you're trying to figure out how to cobble together the resource to do it, everybody in the back of the room is has ideas of people and grants and funding to help you do this work. So please stop by and see them all. And I'm really grateful to all of the state agency partners who trekked up here as well this morning. Um, so with that, I want to um, quickly introduce um, the executive director of the Maine Municipal Association. Uh, Maine Municipal has been one of our closest partners uh, in doing this work. And Kathy Conlow, who some of you may know, uh, former uh, city manager of Bangor, um, has been a huge champion of this work herself personally, having done it. So I want to invite Kathy up just to say a couple welcoming remarks. Um, and then we have a couple of our favorite and most exciting scientists uh, to tell you the good and bad news. So come on up, Kathy. Thanks. Well, good morning, and I'm delighted to be here. And one of the resources I just wanted to quickly mention is the website uh, is fantastic and has a lot of great tools and um, looks at the measurements. So pretty exciting if you get a chance to go look at their um, website. I don't have the address off the end. I Google it. Maine won't wait. It's uh, a fantastic site. So good morning. I'm delighted to be here to welcome you today um, to the Communities Leading on Climate 2023 conference. Uh, as President Obama once said, we're the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. Um, as local leaders in Maine, we have all pondered the question, how will our communities meaningfully work to reduce greenhouse emissions and combat climate change? And it's a daunting task for sure for all of you. With leadership from Governor Mills and GOPIF, Maine Won't Wait offered us a blueprint, technical assistance and funding that communities could act alone or in partnership with the state regional planning groups and other municipalities to make those changes necessary to reduce the impact of climate change. And most importantly, the plan provided us with a framework to measure our success. And successful we have been in the two and a half years or two plus years since Maine Won't Wait was adopted. The results have been amazing and clearly demonstrate the strong partnership between state municipal, municipal governments is not only possible, but when done correctly can yield really impressive results. Um, now with historic funding opportunities in abundance, the governor and municipalities have seized the opportunity to leverage federal, state, and local funds to build, improve, and harden our infrastructure. These targeted investments and strategic improvements uh, have reduced the impact of climate change on Maine communities and the people who live in them. 
Most importantly, we are taking steps to ensure that my, Maine's climate can continue to support the vast biodiversity necessary to sustain us in the future. So finally, I want to congratulate those local leaders that have utilized this unprecedented funding to implement the state's climate action goals in ways that support the unique needs of each community. The collaboration between state municipalities have yielded results that are moving us closer to those goals outlined by the state plan. And what is most impressive is the amount of work that municipalities have completed towards achieving the goals outlined in Maine won't work. Maine won't wait. Sorry about that. <laughs> My mouth won't work. Um, more than 5 million in grants have been directed to over 100, uh, 100 communities for projects. From Limestone to Labatt, Carthage to York, communities across the state are working together with the state to reverse the effects of climate change. Communities are making improvements to lower heating costs, in fact, investing in technology to reduce our overall energy use, investing in EV charging stations, and planning and implementing infrastructure improvements to protect communities against sea level rise and a whole plethora of other things. So in short, the main communities are getting, getting it done. So thank you all. Thank you for having me here and thank you for the partnership. Thank you, Kathy. You are again, an awesome partner. So I appreciate you being here today. Um, so I'm going to uh, call up uh, our two uh, doctors, Dr. Ivan Fernandez and Dr. Susie Arnold, they are both uh, members of the Maine Climate Council. They co-chair the Science and Technical Working Group. I will say we are about to kick off another climate planning process to update the state's plan as required by law. Uh, and these two um, uh, sort of, we want to lead our climate planning with science and facts. And uh, they are... Um, I would say inspirational leaders when it comes to that. So Susie's an expert in marine science. Ivan comes from a background of soils and forests here actually at the University of Maine. Um, and they're gonna give you kind of a quick overview of uh, why are we seeing so much precip precipitation? What's happening with sea level rise? And I think Susie's got, she's gonna try to be hopeful. So I'll pass it off to the two of them. <laughs> So I'm apparently the unhopeful one. So <laughs> hang in there for a few minutes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Ivan Fernandez from here at the University of Maine. For those who are uh, not from here, um, the weather is always mid seventies and sunny. So you're welcome to join us anytime. Uh, Dr. Arnold and I are uh, honored to be here um, and always impressed by the work that's going on in uh, Maine Won't Wait. In GoPIF, I think there's a dark secret that there's actually three of every member of GoPIF, and this is just one of the director penguins we have here this morning because they're doing a fantastic job as everyone here in the room is. So our charge this morning is to talk a little bit about science. That's Hannah Pingree. <laughs> there we go. Um, our charge this, uh, this morning is to talk about science and in all seriousness, the success of uh, any climate action plan, and certainly ours uh, that we can be very proud of here in the state of Maine, uh, is underpinned by science, both in understanding the changing climate uh, and how it informs uh, the solutions that probably everyone in the room here is engaged in. So uh, to, to dig right in, um, this change is different than that. So I'm gonna have to pay attention over here. Um, Probably everyone in the room is familiar with what IPCC is, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, it is uh, under the auspices of the World Meteorological Association and the UN Environment uh, Program. Uh, periodically, it does an assessment of global science around uh, climate change. Um, and the uh, three reports on the left, uh, realizing that some of you are familiar with them and, and perhaps have read them. If you've read all of them, I'm impressed. Um, but the, um, the assessments come out in roughly a seven or eight year cycle. We're currently in the AR6 cycle, so the sixth assessment report um, cycle. Those three light blue documents on the left are the reports that came out in 2021 and 2022. You saw press around them. We discussed them in, uh, in, the, in the media and in various uh, forums. They deal with the physical science of a changing climate, uh, the science around adaptation, and the science around uh, mitigation. 
The three reports to the right in the darker blue were special reports. And the motivation for that, um, the, the IPCC does that from time to time, particularly coming out of the Paris Climate Accord in 2015, there was a sense of urgency to better understand the science given the targets uh, that were set during those proceedings. Um, and you may have, be familiar with them if you ha haven't been. Uh, the first one to, on the left of the dark blue ones is about the oceans and uh, the cryosphere, which is the frozen uh, parts of the world, a little bit less so every day. Uh, the middle one's about land and all of the uh, stressors, uh, particularly climate change that's impacting uh, land resources around the planet. And then the last one is um, the one that was focused at, and at the request of the 2015 Paris Accord to understand the consequences of warming beyond 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade, centigrade by the end of, of the century. <laughs> He's pretty good because he comes uh, when I'm teaching class too and I have an emergency. So we're in good hands. Um, and with a target also of two degrees centigrade. So the point there, two degrees was the target. 1.5 degrees was the aspirational goal. We're not on track to meet either of those, but obviously we are beginning to make, uh, make progress. And we hear more about 1.5 for probably two reasons. Uh, the scientific community is more alarmed about even reaching that uh, threshold. And we're witnessing uh, the changes taking place all the time. And if you watching the news, uh, you could read the papers this morning about heat waves in, in Asia and uh, millions of acres uh, burning in the Pacific Northwest with a heat dome on its way. And if it's a little hazy later today, that's smoke coming from the Canadian fires. Uh, or you can wait till the sunset and they're nice and pretty orange. Um, in March, you may be familiar with this um, that came out and there was some media around it. It's the synthesis, synthesis report, um, which kind of closes the cycle for AR6. Um, doesn't present any new science, but it underscores some critical themes. Um, some of those themes were things that we know, and this is where I have to do this part of the science, uh, that the uh, indicators of climate change are, are increasing and accelerating, that the frequency of extreme events and variability is increasing, um, that every increment of change that we can avoid matters. And so there's nothing really magic about 1.5. So 1.21, 1.22, it all matters in very substantive ways. Um, and then importantly, particularly for today's discussion and somewhat celebration of progress, um, is we have a wide range of strategies and solutions to employ to address this. We're not doing it fast enough, um, but we're beginning. And the increase or the rate of increase in solutions is also increasing. And so that's definitely the good news, but she'll tell you that. We know about the science of climate change here in Maine as well. Many of you I know are familiar with uh, one or more of the documents. We've put out these Maine Climate Future Reports from here, the Climate Change Institute since 2009. Uh, and the big cover there is from the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee's assessment in 2020 um, that covered a wide range of aspects of changing climate um, in Maine. It uh, was specifically designed to uh, support the work of the uh, working groups uh, that supported the council that gave us uh, Maine Won't Wait. And that, that process uh, certainly continues as we move to the next iteration. Uh, the plot is showing you that it's warming. You all know that. Um, it's warmed about 3.2 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the last century, and it will continue to warm. Um, minimums are warming faster than maximums. Winter's warming faster than summer, um, and a whole cascade of changes that come from that. Uh, we know why this is happening and all the work you're doing in your communities uh, and uh, other areas of, uh, of engagement having to do with energy efficiency, and the transition away from fossil fuels is because that curve keeps going up. And you've all seen it probably. This is the CO2 monitoring station in Mauna Loa. Um, it, it, the rate of increase continues to go up. Uh, this, this plot looks like a stair step is telling us that the, the, it's not only increasing, but the rate of increase is increasing. That's slowed a little bit in the past few years because of the pandemic um, and because of the economy, but it hasn't reversed. And so it's still going up and it doesn't happen just in the Pacific Ocean, as we all know. If we look at data from uh, the Tall Tower site in Argyle, Maine here, we see the same trend for all of the greenhouse gases. And so CO2 is going up, methane's going up, nitrous oxide's going up, uh, sulfur hexafluoride's going up. Those are all even far more potent, but 
luckily in lower concentrations, uh, but is increasing. So the, the task remains uh, uh, about how we move forward. The good news is, um, that slide looks different than I thought it did, but um, the good news is that solutions are moving forward. And if you've heard Director Pingree or others talk about the Maine Won't Wait dashboard, if you haven't visited, visit it. It's great because you can see progress unfolding. And so while indicators are of the changing climate are accelerating, uh, and that is exceedingly serious, so are the solutions and the work that you do. And so if I've depressed you, I'm getting off the podium now, and she's coming on. Good morning, everybody. So if you haven't heard, here's some good news. Maine's Climate Action Plan uh, won an award last year from the American Planning Association, and Maine was applauded for demonstrating that, let me see if I, there we go, um, demonstrating that scientific analysis and planning um, was able to put us in a, a position for a better future. So we also know that, that action requires behavior change. And so this is one of the reasons why the scientific and technical subcommittee that Ivan and I co-chair along with Steve Dixon is broadening our scope to include social scientists to help us communicate science most effectively and prompt action. In the following two coastal climate examples, I'll highlight the importance of communicating science in ways that resonate with communities. <clears throat> so the first example is how one community is preparing for the impacts of sea level rise. We know that seas are rising. We can measure it and we do that at five tide gauges up and down the coast from Wells to Eastport. So this slide here is showing data from the Portland tide gauge from 1912 to 2023. And as Ivan mentioned, um, things are accelerating and the rate of increase is also accelerating. What you see with the red line here is the intermediate scenario of 1.5 feet of rise by 2050, which is the commit to manage level in Maine won't wait. So on Islesboro, our first example, while they haven't been measuring sea level, sea level rise locally themselves until last week, um, they're seeing the impacts of rising seas uh, every day. And so here I'm gonna show you two areas of, of vulnerability, high vulnerability on this island. One is this area here known as the Narrows on Islesboro, which during extreme high tides and storms floods and separates the island into two. Another is over here near the ferry terminal. Uh, it also is the home of a historic uh, lighthouse and museum and an area that's of a critical importance to the island. So since around 2018, when the island formed a voluntary sea level rise committee, they've been sharing the best available science and using it to inform their path to adaptation. They've taken a really holistic view to sharing information. Currently, they have an Island Institute fellow that's focused on sea level rise. They've hired a climate resilience project manager with expertise on the impacts of sea level rise on marshes. They're partnering with an engineer here at the University of Maine to install tide trackers on two sides of the island to measure water levels and other environmental parameters. And they're including the island school in every step of the way. Most, recent, oops, most recently, partnering with an artist, which you see here on the right, to install an art installation around communicating the science of sea level rise. And that's at the, at, at the um, the Lighthouse Museum. So people feel really passionately about conserving and preserving that historic lighthouse, which you can see here in the background. And thus it's an excellent location to share information to a broad audience on the island. Uh, and as you can see up on top, the Community Resilience Partnership Community Action Grant has helped Islesboro to make some of this possible. So the second example that I'll share, I'll share has to do with how changes in ocean circulation are directly and indirectly impacting the lobster fishery and the near-term economic consequences these climate impacts will have on coastal communities. It's well known that Arctic warming is causing changes in our region's ocean circulation. Now to simplify it a little bit, we have the Gulf Stream here that is shifting to the north and we have the Labrador current coming down here that carries the cold fresh water from Canada that is retreating. And as a consequence of this, 
around 2010, we saw an influx of warm water coming in through the Northeast Channel into the Gulf of Maine. And the, the warming really progressed in earnest in 2010. And hence, you may have heard of something called the Gulf of Maine, the 2010 Gulf of Maine regime shift. So as a result of this warming, we're seeing major changes in the distribution and abundance of species, most notably perhaps the American lobster. So lobster biomass is shifting to the north and offshore as temperature rises. We're also seeing other changes. All of the main Department of Marine Resources sublegal lobster surveys are pointing to a downturn in the fishery. What you're looking at here are two of DMR's many sublegal lobster surveys. Up here, you've got the trawl survey. Down here, you've got the vent ventless trap survey. Essentially, they're all showing um, downward trends, those that I've shown and those that I haven't shown. And basically, um, these, these sublegals, these sublegal surveys give us an indication of future lobster catch. And so um, gives us a sense that we might be suspecting a, a downward trend in recent years. And so regulators are using these data to inform future management measures to preserve the fishery in the face of climate change. You might be hearing in the news about something that Atlanta Stakes Marine Fisheries Commission is proposing around increasing the minimum size of lobster. All of that is taking into account the science that's being collected around climate impacts and other impacts to the fishery. So we know that lobstering plays an essential role in many Maine coastal communities. These are the 30 towns along the coast with the highest percentage of lobster licenses per capita. On average, in these 30 communities, about 5% of residents hold lobster licenses. Some communities have upwards to 20% of residents holding lobster licenses. The population of these towns tends to be smaller, lower income, older, and less diversified in the workforce than comparable towns, illustrating the vulnerability to economic shocks that communities with a high reliance on lobster are facing. But there's another climate impact that's taking a toll on the lobster fishery. At a community-centric meeting like this, I'd be remiss not to mention the indirect impacts climate is having on the fishery due to climate impacts on the endangered North Atlantic right whale and how more stringent regulations to conserve this endangered species will impact communities. So this infographic shows the impacts of changing ocean conditions on the right whale population during the, the 20, 2000 to 2009 decade on the left and post Gulf of Maine regime shift the decade 2010 to 2019 on the right. And I'll, I'll walk you through it very briefly. So up here we have in the first decade, 2000 to 2009, the Gulf Stream has yet to kind of meander to the north. The, the Gulf of Maine as a result is in its cooler phase. There's higher prey availability. These are the Calanus finmarchicus copepods that are the preferred prey species for the endangered whale. So they're still in high abundance in the Gulf of Maine. And so you have the whales summering in their traditional foraging grounds in the Bay of Fundy and also in Roseway Basin. And during that decade, they were exhibiting higher calving rates and lower mortality rates. If you fast forward to the next decade, post Gulf of Maine regime shift, over here you have the Gulf Stream has shifted to the north. You've got more warm water entering the Gulf of Maine through that Northeast Channel. You've got lower abundance of that critical prey species and the, and the whales are they're moving in search of food. They're now summering up here in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And during this decade, we saw lower calving and higher mortality rates. The short of it is that whales are more vulnerable to ship strikes and entanglements because they're showing up in areas where they haven't traditionally shown up because they need to find food. I think it's useful to keep the link to climate at the center of this conversation because currently the conversation is very polarizing. You're either for whales and against the lobster fishery or vice versa. Framing it as a climate issue allows us to take shared ownership of the decline of not just right whales, but all endangered species that are being impacted by climate. And importantly, it gives us all a shared responsibility in mitigating future climate change. So to reemphasize, how we frame the problem and share the science can lead to improved participation in the solution. Thank you.
Thank you both. And that was hopeful, but sobering. And hopefully it causes you all to, to go home and realize, uh, again, the importance of some team. Um, and I will just uh, welcome Jay Cam, who is from the Northern Maine Development Corporation and also a uh, new member of the Maine Climate Council. So welcome, Jay. He's going to moderate this panel. can't see the name, so you'll have to tell us if we get it wrong. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. As uh, Hannah said, my name is Jay Cam, and I'm senior planner with Northern Maine Development Commission located in Caribou. Um, just a couple of quick things to start with. Today, we have three sessions uh, dealing with electric vehicles. We're dealing with energy efficiency and then resilient communities. All three of them will be run the same way, about a 45 minute panel discussion, uh, followed by 15 or so minutes of uh, questions and answers, and then going back to you at the table with uh, 15 minutes or so, just a discussion on that topic. Um, so it's, it's going to be, a, I think, a fun-filled and informative day, and, and certainly something that I've been looking forward to. On the way down, I had an opportunity really to think about the title of, of this section, Growing Public EV Charging Networks. And, and what really does that mean? And I think that our panelists really typify what, what I was thinking in that one, the EV charging network is growing. Uh, and we've had you know, uh, town managers and, and others that are working within their communities uh, to site uh, electric vehicle charging stations. And we've also had regional and state level of how do we grow that through a funding cycle or, or whatever. So they've been working with communities and regions to do that. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've been with Northern Maine Development Commission for almost 30 years. And if someone truly asked me if I would ever see charging stations in Danforth or in Van Buren, I would have bet probably four paychecks that nope, it was never going to happen. It's happening. And I think that really goes to the hard work that our panelists today um, will be talking about and in, in, in their work. So just very briefly, Joyce Taylor is the chief engineer with the Maine Department of Transportation. Uh, she's gonna be talking about kind of the statewide program, the goals uh, of, of what DOT and others are working on there. And then we have two local or regional kind of projects that we're gonna highlight. Johanna Bachman, who's the Executive Director of Climate to Thrive. And I will be honest, has been, uh, Climate to Thrive has been pretty instrumental in uh, Presque Isle with, with working with uh, EV charging for us. So it's, it's good to see her. Peter Jameson is the Town Manager of the Town of Millinocket. And I know that when we met early on to talk about what's going on, um, you know, many of the concerns that he articulated is certainly what's going on, I think, across at least rural Maine. I can't speak certainly for urban areas. And then Michael Stoddard, the executive director of Efficiency Maine, um, probably a very popular person. I, I refer to him maybe at, at locally as the money guy. Um, you know, in Efficiency Maine, uh, Molly and others have worked very hard, again, in our region to really expand the EV uh, charging network. And we are certainly very grateful for that. So I know you didn't come to listen to me. We will start with Joyce Taylor from the Maine Department of Transportation. I'm going to take the liberty of um, spending two minutes talking about something off my topic. Um, I just want to mention that DOT is at the back and we um, do have some information about some municipal programs that are available to you to check out. I can tell you in the last big storm event, we had DOT lost four big culverts and had to close several bridges due to climate. Um, I, I often say, you know, DOTs are not known for being left of liberal, but we believe in climate because we are experiencing the change to our system. Um, and so we are very aggressively going after grant money for um, upsizing culverts. Um, and so 
that is a really a big, huge focus of ours is to get our culverts to be bigger so they can pass those bigger water storms. But please, I encourage you to go talk to some of our planners that are here and learn about the programs we have. So am I advancing the slides? No. Okay. Oh, I hate these. Whoops, second one backwards. Yep. You know, it's hard when you're the engineer and you screw up technology. <laughs> it's very, it's very humbling. Um, and then it gets better because I printed my talk and it's like double-sided and upside down. So I'm very challenged today. Um, so the challenge, and it was a challenge, and I appreciate Jay's comments because I've been um, working on this for four years and I would not have believed that we would be where we are today. Um, and many thanks to um, the uh, federal government, uh, President Biden, the BIL, our delegation for, for passing um, that huge infrastructure bill that's really giving us um, some money to, to meet our goals. And, you know, we all, many of us participated in the Maine Won't Wait, um, and I co-chair the Transportation Working Group. And our, our biggest focus was transitioning um, passenger vehicles to EVs. That is the number one source of transportation emissions in this state. And it is a huge focus for us to try to get people to accept EVs and to go to EVs. And so part of that is really very thoughtfully um, thinking about where do you have to have charging stations, both you know, level twos is for folks who maybe don't have a garage or are in multi-unit uh, dwellings or workplace charging, as well as fast chargers. And it, it, during that, that work, I know the Nature Conservancy had done a focus group and it was interesting because the cost of EVs was not the number one reason people weren't purchasing them. It was range anxiety. And in this state, we are a huge state. And it became very clear that people, you know, maybe they live in Southern Maine, but they go to Machias once a year to see their aunt and they wanna take their car to do that. And they didn't feel they could. And so we've been really focused on, um, on that issue. So we are really trying to encourage the use of EVs. So that was the challenge, um, the process. So we've been developing a plan as part of the federal money um, in the, the infrastructure law. Um, we had to come up with a statewide EV charging plan. And so we've been working on that. And you can see, um, we also um, really focused on the rural parts of Maine. We really felt Aroostook County, Washington County were major priorities for us to get some fast charging so people really could believe they could get around Maine. Um, we had to declare alternative fuel corridors. We actually probably went a little overboard because we have to build those out um, with the federal money before we can transition off those corridors. So that's something that we are working with the federal government on. And we are also um, right now applying for charging and fueling infrastructure, discretionary grants, I can tell you um, Maine DOT is incredibly aggressive at applying for grants. Um, I think um, we calculated out like out of the whole national share over five years, our, our fair share would be like $12 million. We're applying in the first year for 10 to $15 million because we said, you know what, we're going big. And if, and if they decide to not give it to us, okay, we'll learn from that, but we're gonna go big because we're a big state. We got the same amount of money in the infrastructure law for EV charging as Vermont did. And they're a teeny little geographic state. I'm from there, so I can say that. Um, and But you look at our ge geography, right? And, and so we just really feel and have made the case to the feds behind the scenes that we're a big rural state and we're going to have to be really aggressive about charging stations to get people to transition. So solutions, results, insights. So we've done a lot um, with Efficiency Maine. I should have said the Maine DOT and other state agencies, um, the money is channeling through Maine DOT. We've got um, $19 million from the infrastructure law over five years. We've got the first two years of that out on RFPs right now. Um, we also got $8 million from the Maine Jobs Recovery Plan. And so, we have um, partnered with Efficiency Maine. They may be the, the money guy, but we're the bank. So um, we are working very closely with our partners at Efficiency Maine. 
to plan uh, uh, where we want to go with our RFPs. Um, right now, there's some open RFPs out there. Um, we're continuing on with our Washington County um, look. We'd really like to try to secure something in Machias. I saw the town manager, Bill Kitchen, here, um, but we feel that's an important location. Um, we also are looking at going up the interstate having another charger, fast charger in Augusta, um, going up through Bangor, hitting Medway, Holton to kind of finish off the interstate. Um, we are also looking at Route 1 from Freeport to Ellsworth. And so those are sort of the priorities right now. Our next plan is due August 1st. And so we will be uh, coming up with the next set of priorities. We also have, um, we have um, a notice of funding opportunity right now for Cumberland and York County on, with Efficiency Maine for level two chargers. Um, that's a great opportunity for municipalities to get involved. I would say as part of um, the discretionary grant um, that we're applying for, there's a great opportunity for municipalities if we get that money to apply for some of the funding. So. What I would say is go to this website. It's the DOT website. It links to Efficiency Maine. Um, Taylor, where are you? Raise your hand. Taylor Lebrecht, my colleague, will be here today. Um, talk to her if you want to express your interest as a municipality um, in charging, because we're trying to, um, you all can apply for funds yourself, but we're trying to make sure we're not stepping on each other and applying for the same locations um, because they don't like that in grant world. So we're trying to communicate and coordinate. So thank you. It worked. Good. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you all this morning um, to give a little bit of background um, as mentioned, I'm the executive director for Climate to Thrive, which is a nonprofit organization based on Mount Desert Island, working more increasingly statewide um, on community-driven mitigation solutions to climate change. And so we have had the privilege of working with our island towns as a service provider within the Community Resilience Partnership, which when that partnership was announced, I've just seen the impact it's had locally on accelerating action in our communities. It's been really tremendous. So three of our towns on the island joined the partnership right at the get-go and submitted a regional grant application. And a significant part of that grant application was for electric vehicle chargers in each of those three towns. And they set themselves a specific goal with those chargers. They'd been hearing increasingly from community members who were, many of them renters, um, who were either moving here with electric vehicles or considering purchasing electric vehicles and were concerned about how to charge them, um, particularly because as many folks know, MDI gets quite um, a large tourist population in the summer. And a lot of the previously cited charging infrastructure was really ideal for tourists, but maybe not so ideal for year round residents that needed um, greater access access um, who might not have it at their home if they were a renter. So that was the focus of the funding in this grant around charging infrastructure was to cite these so that it would increase access to year round residents, particularly renters. Um, the towns also wanted to prioritize a community driven citing process, recognizing that collecting a lot of feedback and really involving the community would be key um, to making sure that these chargers were where they needed to be, but also to increase um, community understanding, um, buy in and really participation and engagement in the process. And finally, um, within that community driven process, really early on, it became clear that there was a need not just to preach to the choir, as we all often talk about, um, and engage those who already had EVs and kind of knew the difference between different types of chargers and how to use them, but also those who didn't know a lot about EVs or might even be really skeptical about why would the town be prioritizing using parking spaces for something like this? This isn't going to happen. Um, why are we planning for this? So as I mentioned, there were three towns that were each working on this, but I'm going to focus on the story of the town of Tremont, which is a highly rural community on MDI, has a year-round population of just over 1,400 folks. And as we saw in the map that Susie, Susie showed earlier, um, it's one of those communities that has a really large working waterfront population. And its process was similar to that in each of the towns. Um, hello to whoever that was. Um, so 
the towns each had volunteer committees that kind of took this siting process under their wing. And in the town of Tremont, that was the sustainability committee. And these committees worked very closely with town leadership um, from town managers to different types of town committees. Um, each of the towns were going through comprehensive planning processes. So really trying to integrate these different folks into the process and also collecting feedback from com community members, either through kind of informal service at different types of events, having conversations about charging and potential siting, um, or through formal surveys. In Tremont, two initial um, ideal locations were identified by the committee. And one was um, the top picture here is the harbor. And so as you can see, there's a parking lot there at the harbor. And the committee thought, well, it'd be great to put a charger there where folks who are using the working waterfront could park their vehicle, charge. Um, these are level two chargers, so it takes some time to, to build up a charge and take their boat out um, and, you know, work and then come back and their vehicle would be charged. Um, so that seemed really ideal. Also, potentially, maybe there could be some way to work it into the electrification of, of the boating fleets as that started to occur. Um, in conversation with the Harbor Committee and the Harbor Master, they were concerned about using parking space there for charging and also skeptical about electrification of transportation, in particular boats. Um, so rather than kind of giving up, this isn't going to work out, the Tremont Committee really did a great job of focusing on how can we keep these same goals but find the next best scenario. And so this second picture at the bottom is right up the hill from the harbor. You can see the water in the distance and there's a little teeny tiny white sign that says harbor down here. Um, and so they are going to be setting a charger, level two charger in this parking lot. And it's a very doable walk just right down the hill to take a boat out. So same set of goals accomplished. Um, while not trying to really force anybody to do anything, which I'm going to come back to in just a second as we close. And the second site that they were really excited about was in the paved parking lot of the school. And this is the top picture here. The paved parking lot is over kind of to um, your right. And the school had different types of concerns about setting a charger in that parking lot. But this dirt lot is just to the left of the driveway that leads back to where school buses are parked. And that is the second location where they're going to be siting a level two charger. It's also a bus stop for the island's bus system and is near a bunch of different year round rentals. So they were able to keep same set of goals shift slightly. Um, and in a highly rural community that doesn't have a downtown, really trying to think about how to site these for year round residents is challenging, but they really kept that focus um, and were able to find locations. And this was true for all the towns. All the towns had a bit of a process around needing to kind of go to the second best um, location, but were successful in finding locations that would expand that access to year round residents, which felt really important, keeping that goal throughout. We also found that the siting process was a wonderful tool to increase understanding of EV technology and rates of adoption of EVs, as well as the different incentives that are now available to help folks obtain electric vehicles. Um, so the process was a phenomenal educational tool. And finally, just circling back to that importance of engaging the full community, regardless of what their experience might be with electric vehicles or what their outlook might be regarding electric vehicles, um, by not pushing the Harbor Committee, for example, in Tremont um, to do something that really didn't feel comfortable for them at this point, the Tremont Committee hasn't shut the door. Um, basically for their openness to, you know, right now it's, they're, they're skeptical, but they're, they didn't shut any doors in that process. And so it will be a great opportunity where the Harbor Committee will see that charger up the hill, see folks using it, hopefully a lot, and maybe be open in the future to one being right down um, in the parking lot. So that continued conversation with all different types of perspectives was really key throughout. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for for um, such great information and and stories about um, you know your different projects and and how we're all um, engaged in this this EV charging uh, network work in the in the state of Maine. Um, as mentioned, I'm Peter Jameson. I'm the town manager in Millinocket. 
Uh, we are a proud member of the Community Resiliency Partnership um, and have uh, taken great advantage of some of that funding to, to decrease um, our energy usage in our, in our municipal building and look forward to um, taking good advantage of that funding in the future. Um, you know, and, and that great work and a lot of the, the work we're going to talk about just this moment is, is actually spearheaded by our uh, community initiatives director in our, in our town of Millinocket. Um, her name's Amber Wheaton, and she's doing some incredible work uh, leading these, these efforts. So, uh, you know, I take, I do not take full credit for any of this. Um, so the, the, the challenge we had in Millinocket is that we are very much a uh, we're very much reliant on tourism and visitation to our town and to our, our whole region. Our, our region works together on, on many things. Uh, we see a trend, an uh, in increase in visitors bringing with them their electric vehicles. We experience that there is one EV charger in our town one universal EV charger. And let me say that Baxter Park uh, brings about 100,000 people on their own, let alone the National Monument, let alone the whitewater rafting, the camping, the hunting, the fishing, the skydiving. You know, it's it's all there and people come in peak season and they have one opportunity to charge their car. So you can imagine that line gets pretty lengthy. So as the community, as the town, we identified in our ongoing needs assessment list that somebody needed to do something about EV charging options in our town. Um, having identified that, you know, we, we then are at the point of, of, of who takes action and how. Um, is that the town? Is that, you know, a, a, a private investor? It's on our list. And when the opportunity arise, arises, we are able to act on it. Our process began with an open door and an introduction to the EV charger program with, with Efficiency Maine. Uh, we, having had already recognized that as a need in our community with the growing uh, EV traffic that, that comes year after year, um, we recognize this as a perfect opportunity for the town to actually jump on board and, and start establishing a plan. We, we understood that the impact is great for um, climate resiliency as well as you know, a good way to spin a financial benefit to our community members as well. Um, so we were, we had all of the right ingredients to make this happen. We um, have a downtown corridor where the municipality owns several parking lots. Um, it's a fairly high traffic area. It's in, um, it's in a revitalization mode right now with, with um, reviving business and, and bringing new business to the community. We saw our municipal parking lots as a great option for location, right? We had the land. Uh, we had an opportunity for funding with Efficiency Maine. Uh, we happened to have some uh, remaining balance in a community development block grant fund that was already geared towards electrical infrastructure in our downtown. Um, and we had a, an opportunity with, with the Nature Conservancy as well for um, a small amount of money to um, help cap off the expenses related to this. Uh, so with, with the land, with the funding, um, with the you know, generous work of some uh, with a local electrical contractor that you know helped helped our 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 knowledge along the way and how to how to create the uh, electrical infrastructure plan around that. We we had our solution. What we what we learned along the way, what we were what we were strongly reassured of along the way, is the importance of a solid plan for community education um, and the importance of having a clear message on why you're doing this and how you're doing this. We found ourselves in a situation where our bid for the installation of these chargers went out 
prematurely before the education to the community that we were doing it or how we were doing it, though it had been discussed at several meetings of our town council and, and, and committees, we all know uh, the participation rates of community members at our town council or city council meetings. Um, so our community finds out we're doing this by uh, learning that we're bidding the work. Um, so immediately uh, hostility and negativity um, we're in rural Maine. They love their internal combustion engines and EV chargers are evil until we were able to get, get back out in front of the game with our very clear and consistent messaging um, why we're doing it, right? We understood that our community members don't own electric vehicles. There are, I think, two. And we understand that we're not going to get rich from doing this. They were upset that they felt we were, you know, investing town money, taxpayer money to yet again cater to tourism traffic instead of the local people. Uh, what we were able to do is to educate them that we had the land, all of the money is coming from either rebates or grant funding that we were using creatively to, to take control of this, to cater to our visitation traffic, to make it more accommodating for them to visit us, to um, be patrons of our local downtown businesses, uh, to be have a successful stay in the region and to continue to invest in our community. Um, and, and we were able to do this at no cost to them, the taxpayer of our community. What we see on the other side of that is a small amount of revenue coming to our community while we're you know, making positive impact to climate change and while we're um, bringing more money into our downtown business corridor. We, in the end, have municipally owned revenue producing infrastructure that is helping to build the EV charging network and make this transition um, playing our part statewide in our local community. And, you know, we are incredibly grateful for this opportunity and thankful to the Efficiency Main program, the Community Resiliency Partnership, um, and of course the great work of our Community Initiatives Director in our town, uh, for, for seeing this opportunity and, and jumping on it. I think that it's going to come a long way and have a very positive impact in our community overall. Thank you. We good? Good morning. I'm Michael Stoddard. I'm the executive director of the Efficiency Main Trust. Uh, I want to start out by thanking uh, Hannah's team and the governor's office of policy and innovation in the future for inviting us and including us here. And, um, and I want to acknowledge right out of the gate that while it's our work to provide resources for all the different customers of Maine to do these kinds of projects, whether those customers are municipalities or schools or businesses or individuals, um, we wouldn't be able to do that without the money everyone's talking about. And that money is uh, a decision that policymakers make about where to allocate the funds that they get. We couldn't do any of this work if Hannah's team at, at the governor's office of policy innovation and future. And if the main DOT and Joyce's team didn't say, hey, this is a good way to allocate some of the funds we're getting, let's do it. 
Uh, so those folks need your support. All of the legislators that come from your towns need your support. They need to be reminded. And, and you know, Peter was just giving an example of Millinocket. The town councilors need your support to make the case for why this is a good idea. And so uh, we're very grateful to the folks who make those cases on our behalf. And we're very happy to be administering these programs. Um, I couldn't possibly review all of the information that we have for you to use both to make decisions for your own town about whether EVs or EV chargers are the right thing or how to do that. Uh, but we also, and we also know you are leaders in your community to talk to the businesses and the individuals who live in your town and they're thinking about these questions also. So I couldn't possibly run through all of that in the time we have. I wanna make sure I mention two resources. One, we have a table at the back of the room and I encourage you to go there. We have uh, you know, these kinds of things which we will gladly send you and you can take home with you or you can hand out to folks in your town. And this is a brochure about uh, EV chargers and how what to consider. Uh, how to proceed if you're thinking about putting in EV chargers in your town. Um, so we have that resource at the back of the room and then we have a fantastic website, efficiencymain.com. Everything I'm gonna say is there somewhere, dig around a little and you'll find it. If you don't call us and we'll help you find your way. So I'm gonna start with cars and, and trucks and then I'm gonna add a little bit to what Joyce said about the chargers. So first thing to know is the real goal here is not to have EV chargers. They don't do anything by themselves. They are a stepping stone to having more vehicles because what we're really trying to do is help people save money and reduce carbon and still be able to get around and do all the things we want to do in our society. So we need to get the cars to convert from internal combustion engines to electric or other uh, alternative fuels that are much lower in carbon. And the good news about this new technology is it does all those things. It will reduce your energy costs. It costs less to fuel your vehicle with electricity than it does with gasoline or diesel fuel. It also is much less maintenance cost. You don't have an exhaust system. You don't have spark plugs. You don't have a tailpipe. So you don't have many of the annual operating costs of maintenance that you would go with an ICE vehicle when you get an EV. So they are a really interesting deal from the perspective of economics. Obviously, they also are cleaner. And so uh, that's a nice dividend. But when you're trying to make the case to the folks in your town about why they should consider supporting this, remember that it's gonna lower the costs. Um, how can you get there? How are you going to be able to start adding these vehicles to your fleets? And how are you gonna convince the businesses and the, and the residents of your town that they should start moving in this direction? Um, fantastic new resources coming out of the federal government. The first starting place is with these federal tax credits. I will not try to review this for you, but they are significant tax credits. Go to the link that's at the bottom of this page and you can get more information about those tax credits, but that's an important starting place. And I, I highlighted here or I bolded the point that it will apply extend the tax credit to tax exempt organizations. I don't know if that includes municipalities, but I'm assuming that it does. Um, even if it doesn't, we experienced before this version of the tax credits in the earlier iterations, um, if you are leasing a vehicle from the dealership, the lease company can take advantage of the tax credit and they'll reduce the lease price by that amount. And then you have obviously a much smaller lease that you have to pay. So we know that a bunch of municipalities did that uh, two years ago when we had our big promotion for municipalities on EVs. Speaking of which, that's the other set of resources that are available. Thanks to, again, some very generous and thoughtful policy making from the governor's team, we have a fund that we can use to uh, provide rebates for qualifying electric vehicles. Um, specifically for municipalities, we are including a rebate of $7,500 on qualifying 
battery electric vehicles and $2,000 on plug-in hybrids. If you're in one of these more rural areas and you think that a 200 mile range on an EV just isn't gonna get it done for you, you're gonna be too stressed out about whether you can get to the next charging station, don't get one. Get, don't get one of those, get the plug-in hybrids, which will switch over to gas when it runs out of electric. 90% of the time you're gonna drive around town and the battery is gonna be all you need. And that 10% of the time when you have to go on a long trip, switch over to gas, there you go. So there's something for everybody here. Uh, I wanted to add this slide just because I know you're not only thinking about what you can do for your municipality or your local government uh, uh, vehicles. You obviously have businesses and, and residents who are asking you questions about whether they should consider it. Please, please share with them information that we have rebates for uh, all individuals. And in particular, we are proud to be offering um, a moderate income level uh, rebate. So we have different tiers based on income level. So moderate income and low income have increasing tiers. So we're trying to make this available to everybody uh, in all parts of the state. Uh, and again, the funding that was allocated to us through uh, the governor's budget uh, from a year ago is helping us get that done. This is uh, just a plug for you, no pun intended, to go to the website where we have an entire page and, and pages and pages on EV resources, guidebooks, videos, um, locator tools for how to find an electrician who will do this work, how to find a dealership that will sell these cars. Um, I'm probably close to the end of my time. I want to just add a little bit of color to what Joyce was mentioning about opportunities going forward for EV chargers. Um, we love working with towns who are interested in being host sites like Millinock it was to use their property as a host for EV chargers, but don't feel limited to that. Um, the future is probably um, mostly going to be private property owners. What are today gas stations will in the future be gas and electric charging stations. Why not? That's who just won most of the bids along I-95 uh, and in Bangor and Newport and uh, Lewiston and Auburn. Those are gas stations that are adding EV, high speed EV chargers now. So if it doesn't feel like something you want to do with your town, go talk to the local businesses in your town and see if the restaurant or the hardware store or the uh, motel wants to be a site because we have rebates for them as well. They can participate in the offerings that we have. Um, I would strongly encourage you to be thinking about level two chargers at a municipal level, not a level three charger. A level three charger is going to bring you into price ranges of a couple hundred thousand dollars. And my hunch is you're more interested in the five to twenty thousand dollar range. Uh, you probably also want the people who are charging up to stick around a little while, go downtown, get a cup of coffee, maybe a burger, and uh, do a little window shopping. That's going to happen with a level two charger, not with a level three charger. Level two takes a couple of hours. Um, as Joyce said, we do currently have an opportunity that is on the street. Um, th this is phase two or round two of this opportunity. So it's limited to York and Cumberland counties. We just completed all the other 14 counties before that. And here's a map of where those chargers are going. So that's adding another 49 uh, sites and 100 plus ports where people can charge up. So that's a little bit of progress. Um, and I wanna also pick up where um, Joyce was talking about this next round of federal grant funds that we're going to be asking for. It's focusing on communities. So the first part of it, which we're not showing you here, is the highways and the big major routes. Next thing we're going to focus on is the communities. And so we're putting in applications for those funds and it will give us money. We expect to do a combination of the very high speed chargers um, and then also some more of these level two chargers and the priorities are going to be communities, 
we're breaking it into pieces, but some of it will be about focusing on the bigger municipal areas, the Portlands and the Bangors, the places where there's maybe affordable housing and apartment buildings where people don't have off street parking. So that's a, a, that's a need we need to address in those places. And then on the rural side of things, we'll be looking at regional service centers as a starting point. And then as you see here, number five, uh, other municipal sites like the kinds that we're currently funding uh, that you heard in Millinocket. So we'll be able to extend that to many more communities. Uh, this is what the map will look like when we get done spending all this federal money. And this is only a map of the high speed level three chargers. This is not including all the hundreds and hundreds we estimate will be able to pay for a thousand level two chargers across the state when we're done with this round of federal funding. So a very ambitious and comprehensive network of public charging. Uh, we're hopeful that that helps the quote unquote range anxiety become a thing of the past. And uh, if you have questions, you wanna dig into this more, please check out our website where we have uh, a wealth of resources and we'd be happy to work with you. Thanks very much. Just before we get to the question and answers, Joyce had one more point that she would like to make. I just wanted to mention that what Michael and I both talked about the discretionary grants. If you don't see yourself up there or you don't get one this year, there are three more years of funding to come. So um, don't panic. I mean, we're gonna be aggressive every year applying for these discretionary grants. So um, they combined the first two years, but there'll be another three. So as I was listening to the speakers, I, I was thinking again about Arusta County. And since I don't get out of there very often, I, I was thinking that, you know, three, four years ago, as Joy said, we were ringed in uh, Quebec and in New Brunswick by EV chargers with, I think, one uh, in the county. And, and that is very quickly changing. Uh, we're, we're certainly looking at it from an economic development standpoint. We have two national scenic byways and a federally designated bike route and range anxiety from those visiting. So, I mean, all of the topics today are, are very similar to what we're experiencing in the county. Um, and it, it's, you know, through the good work of, of all of the, the panelists that we're able to at least get, get moving in the, probably the right direction. So with that, I would like to open this up to about 15 minutes worth of questions. If anybody has any, we'll certainly call on you and direct it to the right. Yes. I understand the importance of getting the vehicle network started first, but I'm curious whether as this rolls out in the next couple of years, if there's rebates either either the federal or the state level for light duty commercial, especially farming equipment for, uh, you know, small dump trucks, um, tractors and those sorts of um, vehicles that assist with the uh, agricultural community. Um, I'm not aware of agricultural necessarily, but that doesn't mean it's not in the federal bill. Uh, I think you have to read the language. There, there are um, some rebates for commercial trucks. So it's, uh, they're not significant, though, when you consider the price of the trucks and the taxes or the registration fees they pay. Um, so I think we're hoping that there will be more to come in, the, in that arena. I'll just add, there's a few constraints right now. One is the technology. So we tend to focus on the rebates that we have on technology that are commercially available and being mass produced. Right now, that's passenger vehicles, that you have Ford F-150 and other kind of pickup trucks, like the Rivian pickup trucks, you get heavy duty pickup trucks and vans. So large vans. That covers a huge percentage of the vehicles that are on the roads in Maine, but obviously not all. And so as the manufacturers bring on the next level of vehicles, which tend to be bigger and heavier, 
we will add those to the revenue bar as funds allowed. So funds allowed is the other constraint. Um, we're lucky to have a, a good chunk of funds right now. It should have been all used up a year ago if we had kept at the pace we were going. What happened was the pandemic and then huge interruptions to the supply chain for car manufacturers. So I'm sure anyone in this room has experienced or knows somebody who has experienced it's hard to buy a car right now whether you want a used car or any kind of vehicle, frankly. And so the combination of the fact that the bigger, heavier, and more um, niche applications of vehicles, like tractors, for example, or agricultural vehicles, are the later stages of what is going to get converted to EVs. And some of them are just not here yet. And secondly, even what is commercially manufactured is not showing up at dealership lots or being available because of the constraints of the supply chain. So I think we just have to preach a little bit of patience. There's nothing to say that we wouldn't make them eligible for uh, incentives when when, they, when we get to that point. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, if I may. Uh, there are several uh, manufacturers now of electric tractors, which is great. I have a farm. We have a farm. And tractors are good. And in California, they're doing a process where, at the time I looked at it, the state of California and other organizations would, would basically cover 80% of the cost of a new electric tractor, provided you, you dispose, have disposed of properly the old one. So I think the avenue, if you look on the West Coast, is going to be advantageous as we want to move to Maine, being an agricultural state. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on that just so. Um, we actually at DOT has sent two of our maintenance people um, to a conference in California on trucks where they got to drive trucks. And um, I can tell you, um, you want to talk about skeptical maintenance folks. Um, they went, though, drove some trucks and had a ball. I mean, loved it. The tour was amazing. I got to hear all about how fast they went and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's my experience when you put somebody in an electric vehicle, they really like it. So I, I think, though, you know, we, we have a statewide stakeholder group with the trucking industry in particular over the last year. And I think it's the heavy duty, um, heavy vehicles, the construction equipment that is just not there for mass use yet. And because of the skepticism, I think, but I think it's coming, you know, if, I think that um, my folks came back and said, you know, there's some trucks we saw that we think could work for us. And I'm like, great, that's, that's a great start. Yes, ma'am. I've been wondering what's going to happen to all the other trucks, all the current trucks and cars. Um, I mean, one of the issues is how does everybody buy a new electric vehicle? It's expensive and maybe not in the showroom yet. So the, just the cost of those is such a barrier to people, even with the rebates, I have to say. But what's going to happen with all the things that were all the regular cars and trucks we're getting rid of? Couldn't we find a way to convert uh, present cars and trucks, like take out the old engine and put in the new electric? I mean, what are we going to do with all that stuff? It doesn't seem like a very likely scenario to me, given the fact that the batteries that go into these vehicles are so huge, they are, the, the vehicles themselves have to be designed in a way to fit that battery. And what they're doing is they're making it like a skateboard. The entire bottom of the vehicle is, is the battery pack. So it seems unlikely to me that most vehicles will be able to be retrofitted the way you're describing. Uh, I don't have a good answer on what will happen to the old ones. I think we'll just drive them into the ground. Um, I do want to though, comment on your your perception of the incremental cost of an EV, and I just want to I want to provide some optimism that uh, there's lots of indications that as they mass produce these electric vehicles, the prices are coming down to the point where they are comparable, and in some cases even less than. A equal size type of vehicle that happened just last month with the Tesla Model Y. They dropped the price, so it's actually cheaper than a comparable combustion vehicle. So I think we should feel optimistic that the continued advances in the batteries, which is where the real price adder is coming from, 
are, are coming down, these, these vehicles will become price, uh, they, they will reach what's called price parity. Um, and maybe we won't need all, all the tax credits and all the rebates anymore after a certain point. In fact, I would assume that's the case. I don't think there's going to be enough money to pay everybody every time and forever when they go buy a vehicle. Eventually, this will just be the kind of vehicle that is on the lot. So a question here. The, the, the devil is in the details. I'm an engineer by, this, by uh, trade, at least in my past life. I've spent 30 years as a power design, power electronic design engineer. A type three charger would be a terrific example of a challenging design. Uh, my most most of my concerns as a design engineer were behind the power, you know, power outlet. The other part of this problem is that uh, was highlighted by a recent Nova. Anybody watch Nova? It's a nerd street. Session on Nova where Miles O'Brien, one of my kind of like favorite guys, got in a car and drove from Boston to Maine. And it was really a trial by fire of the charging systems. He had a modern electric vehicle, totally electric, and he tried to get up into deep into Maine, charging along the way. And during it, at one point, he stopped at a functioning class three charger and the camera was looking and he plugged in and bingo, it worked. And as it was uh, working, it was drawing 163 kilowatts instantaneously. Just to put that in context, your typical home average would be less than 10 kilowatts. A, a medium sized manufacturing facility would be about 160. So it's like when you plug in a medium, a uh, fast charger, you're plugging in a what amounts to power grid, almost a direct short. <laughs> it's an instantaneous <laughs> load. It's you know something like a medium sized manufacturing facility. So the the problem is not just chargers; it's what provides the power to right. the chargers, and uh, and that's just to get a let's say an hour charge if you're on a long road trip, so you can have your vehicle charged by. Uh, by the time you finish eating dinner. And that's the other, the other aspect of Maine in particular, because we're so, it's such a big state with such a low, relatively low population density that our electric uh, grid is going to even be more challenged than most other places. I don't know if that's kind of a challenge question if you want to address it. Uh, I give it a shot. I, I will say that the utilities are well aware of this. Our organization and the DOT, the government's energy office are well aware of this. We've been thinking about it a lot. Um, I think it's relatively good news for the immediate future, which is our estimates of the grid uh, capacity on the distribution level right now in Maine is that it has ample capacity to add these EVs and all the heat pumps that we expect to add between now and 2030. Um, that said, we are going to have to get busy now building out the grid, making it bigger and stronger and more robust so that it can handle the load growth that will continue thereafter. Um, this is not going to not happen. This is going to happen. This is happening. We are switching to heat pumps and we are switching to electric vehicles. It's going to happen. So all we got to do now is make sure we build out the grid and build out the energy supply to power that grid. Um, you're exactly right. All those things are very real considerations. I think we can get busy right now because we know the grid capacity in most parts. There's going to be little pockets here and there, little circuits where they're just not going to be able to take a very, very large new high-speed charger, especially if there's four or eight charger being added to that spot. But most of the grid in Maine is going to be fine and we'll we'll get through. Um, I do think we need to have an attitude change and a culture change about our relationship with the grid. We have to make peace with the fact that it, it needs to be built out just like our road system is being built out. If we want to get around, we need roads. If we want to charge up our heat pumps and our and our EVs, we're going to need a bigger grid. I, I would add oops. Um, that at Main DOT on our webpage, you can find these studies. But we um, worked with our transit agencies who um, voluntarily wanted us to look at what it would take to go electric with the transit systems. 
And it, it's kind of what I would call a medium look, but it gets into the charging requirements, what's needed for, for upgrades for the charging, um, what power do they need? And what's really interesting is there were conversations with the utilities. And I'll be honest, it, um, it was better than I expected. So I think that as part of all of this, we are having those detailed conversations as part of the truck group that we met with. Um, CMP offered to look at, you know, Gorham is a good example where there's like three really big um, earthwork contractors and saying, okay, what would it take in Gorham at the substation to get Grondon and Shaw Brothers and, you know, and, and someone else all charging every night when they come back from their jobs? And so I think there we are getting into those kinds of details and looking at, at what that means. And just to piggyback off what Michael was saying, yes, that building on our grid has to be our priority and we have to do it really intelligently and thoughtfully. And I'm sure many folks are aware that there's an integrated grid planning process um, that's underway at the main PUC right now. And that's supposed to be an open process to communities. And just speaking from my experience, I think that for those who are representing municipalities in this room um, or, or rural communities in the state, getting involved is really important because we need to be pressuring for that change because Mike's right, this is, this is what is going to happen. And if Maine, um, our PC and our utilities go about this intelligently, then it will benefit all of us. And if they don't, then we will all suffer. There's a question here. Hi, I have two questions from the folks on Zoom. Um, so the first is, are there plans for supporting different and increased needs for municipal fire and rescue services, given the EV batteries may be more flammable and difficult to extinguish? And my second is, how many of installed EV chargers use direct solar? Um, so the first is about first responders and supporting them. And the second is whether or not EV chargers can use solar with only backup electricity from the grid. Thank you. I'll, I'll just say that I think there's a lot of disinformation about fires right now. And we just, you and I have talked, Jess Scott, okay. Um, we have got to do a better job of getting real information out to folks. And um, we, you know, in fact, I, I have a research office. They did a piece of research for me because I was um, getting frustrated by it. And I get why people are asking. Um, but really, if you look, internal combustion engines catch on fire more than anything else do. And so you have to get into the weeds a little bit and look at the data and look at the information. Um, and you know, same thing with e-bikes and the whole thing going on with e-bikes about whether they can be in, in a building or not. Um, so I think that we, as, as a state, um, state government and efficiency name, we have to, um, there are training classes out there for EV fires. Um, there are organizations that have some really great information. They are different. Um, they absolutely are. But you can still um, go in and do re rescue or, um, you know, you can fight that fire. So I think we have to get the real information out there and make it available to our EMS folks who are often volunteer and, you know, working really hard to protect all of us. And, you know, they deserve to get the information. And I do feel like um, that is a step that we really have to, to get rolling on. What's the second question again? Solar power charge. Oh, I don't know if any of you. I, don't know. I think there might be. I think there might be one out in Oxford, Norway area. Those folks have been really creative about um, designing different kinds of EV setups. It's not typical. Uh, it's not necessary. Um, you're going to need batteries uh, to store the power that you do get off the solar. Um, and I think, uh, as as the prior questioner uh, pointed out, the, the the speed and the volume at which these bigger more, more modern EVs draw that power is going to get sucked up pretty quickly. So, um, but, but it absolutely uh, can happen. And it's not an example of direct solar, but I got to mention my final slide is town of Tremont has a municipal array um, that is for power, it's on a cattle landfill and for power and municipal energy needs, and it produces more than the town uses at the moment. So um, the excess is going to be. Uh, it's, you know, all about the account at that point. It's not direct solar, but we'll be going for the charges. So unfortunately, we have time for one more question. Oh, 
Well, this may propel us to another discussion. I'm Jim Fisher, I'm the town manager in Deer Isle, and um, also the chair of the Hancock County Planning Commission. And we've been talking, Joyce knows about corridor planning with DOT for decades, Jay, Judy, Joan, I mean, the whole gang of us are probably here. <laughs> and we always looked at transportation as a way to shape land use. And I've been arguing since we got into the EV debate that we, we ought to think small, not, not always think about how we're going to move people long distances. If we have range anxiety, maybe our range is too big. And so I'm excited by electric pedal bicycles. I'm excited by the idea of thinking about the transit-oriented development we were talking about before the EV explosion. And I, I think we need to think about that. It, we're, we have a golden opportunity here while we design this alternative fuel corridor to think about land use and the long-term implications of people being satisfied with the space they're in, having walkable, livable communities, not needing a car at all. That's our future, is really reducing our energy demand of any sort, and then thinking about how we can meet that demand with renewable energy. So maybe we also had other priorities because this is the EV charging panel. We didn't talk yeah. about it, but certainly um, viable, reliable transit, um, maybe even um, you know fast transit, place rapid transit is part of the uh, more walkable, bikeable communities. Is another one of the strategies. So even though we didn't talk about those, I can assure you that is certainly part of the conversation. Thank you. Jim. Thank you. Uh, one, I'd like to thank our panelists for today's discussion. I think it was, it was outstanding and a lot of great work is being done across the state. So if we could give them a hand. All right, friends. Thank you for making your way back to your tables. Hope you had a great chance to connect with each other during that break. And got a, a sense of who you want to sit with at lunch so we can continue these conversations throughout the day. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. I am also the proud co-chair of the Buildings, Infrastructure, and Housing Working Group of the Maine Climate Council. So it makes a lot of sense for me to be standing up here today with some really terrific speakers for our second panel of the day, energy efficiency in main buildings. Everybody here is well acquainted, I am sure, with the climate and clean energy goals established by Governor Mills and set in statute by the Maine legislature back in 2019. Goals like reducing carbon pollution, 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050, increasing our renewable energy to 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. You may have seen that that goal is now moved up an entire decade because of the fabulous work by many of the people in this room and beyond. And you probably know what an important role modernizing Maine's buildings will play in reaching those goals. Heating, cooling, and lighting our homes and commercial buildings are responsible for nearly a third of our state's greenhouse gas emissions. We're the most heating oil dependent state in the country with 60% of our homes heated by fuel oil compared to just 4% nationally. You know all those numbers, but the centrality of Maine's buildings in our climate action plan goes a lot deeper than that. We're talking about our homes, our schools, our town offices, the, the places where life in Maine takes place day in and day out. So when the Buildings Infrastructure and Housing Working Group and the Climate Council and many of you got together to put for the, our first climate action plan, it made sense to go bold when it comes to buildings, to set really ambitious goals like transitioning to heat pumps by installing 100,000 new heat pumps by 2025, including at least 15,000 in income eligible households, 
to make a bold goal for increasing energy efficiency, weatherizing 17,500 homes by 2025, including at least 1,000 low-income homes to adopting modern building codes and climate-friendly building materials and leading by example in public buildings. That last one is really important and is the focus of our panel conversation today. I don't need to tell you, modernizing public buildings reaps a whole bunch of rewards for all of us. First one, easiest sell, Talking about saving taxpayer dollars. Who doesn't like that? That's a winning message. But improving our public buildings also gives us a really important opportunity to, to socialize the value of these improvements. Once you see solar on the town office, it feels a little bit less weird to consider it on your own home. Once you hear from your friends and neighbors who work in that town office that they no longer have the little space heater under their desk because it's so cold, you think, wow, I would love to retire that space heater in my own house. You're all here today, so you know that we're already on the right track, that we're making really good progress. Mainers have installed more than 82,000 new heat pumps since 2019, more than 29,000 last year alone. Raise your hand if you're one of the proud owners of one of these new heat pumps. Congratulations. You were warm and toasty all winter and you're going to be calm and cool this summer. Efficiency Maine has expanded existing weatherization programs with $25 million in additional funding from the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan for residential weatherization, another $25 million for energy efficiency incentives in municipal, county, and school buildings. Maine Housing will receive almost 37 million for weatherization through the federal bipartisan infrastructure law. We've got strong leadership from Governor Mills, the team at GOPIF, and all of our state agencies. We have an award-winning climate action plan that's rooted in community and science and developed with many of the brilliant minds right here in this room and truly a mind-boggling amount of federal funding flowing from the largest climate action investment in history, the Inflation Reduction Act. We are on the right track. But more than anybody, you all know, this is hard work. A mind-boggling amount of federal funding is mind-boggling. How do we build programs that work? How do we connect the dots between the needs and the goals and the funding and the contractors and the paperwork? How and where do we start? I am thrilled to be here today with so many smart, dedicated, and organized people who are answering those questions every day. I don't think any of us have figured it all out, but between us, we have made a pretty good start. On our panel today, we have Belle Ryder who's assistant town manager here in Orono. She's been grappling with how to get the most out of the town's finite facilities budget. And I think finite budgets are something we can all relate to. Doretta Colburn co-chairs Peer Waterford. That's Partners in Energy Efficiency and Resilience. She's gonna share about the partnerships that stepped up to connect those big ideas about climate resilience to concrete steps. And if you've ever sat in a community meeting where you felt completely inspired and then went home and said, wait, what are we doing? <laughs> She's gonna have some tips for you. Jasmine Lamb chairs the Pleasant Point Resilience Citizens Committee. We all know that every Maine community is unique, but our tribal communities have an extra layer of complication and, and issues to navigate. Jasmine's going to share how she's helping to bring people together to advance energy justice at Sabayak. And Ross Anthony works on buildings and energy efficiency in the governor's energy office. He's going to zoom out and orient us to all of the resources and programs to help us get started and where we can find them. 
We're going to follow the same format that uh, our transportation colleagues modeled so brilliantly during the morning session. So we'll hear from these folks for about 45 minutes. While you're listening to their stories, I hope you'll, you'll notice the details that have made their work so successful and start to note some of the lessons that each of us may be able to take home today. After their presentations, we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A as a large group, and then we'll get to really dig into their, their ideas and insights and advice with our tables. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you, especially you four, for joining us. And um, I am going to turn it over to you, Belle. Thank you, Kathleen. Let me make sure that I have all my notes in place. I'll try to keep myself pinned to the microphone rather than wandering around, as is my general want. Um, as she mentioned, I am Bell Ryder. I'm the assistant town manager for the town of Orono, and I'm here to talk about um, doing municipal building energy audits. So we all have the same problem. There's lots of different cliches that you might hear about this. It's uh, champagne taste, beer budget, um, do more with less. Our personal favorite in Orono is infinite needs, finite resources. So I'm an engineer by training, so I kind of work thing, through things as a um, formula. So we have aging buildings. I'm sure everybody out there has that. Uh, we have a community desire to spend less and also um, reduce our carbon footprint, usually spending less and reducing the carbon footprint. Long term, they, met, they mate, but it's a short term um, conflict. Um, our council has a real desire for data-driven um, decisions. They want to know that what they're doing is backed by the numbers. And we have limited resources, both staff, time, and expertise. We're not um, experts in everything and also money. All of that means that in order to move forward, you need to plan um, and figure out where you currently are. So, oh, I didn't realize the slide would still be in here. Fantastic. Um, so, for, so you have to know what you have and plan for what you want. Um, and that means that you need to define the scope of whatever plan that you're going to um, end up with. What buildings are you gonna do? What data will you be able to provide? How comprehensive a review are you asking for? The um, American Society for Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers has three standard levels of energy audits. And those are really helpful when you're writing an RFP because knowledgeable people have already written out what's defined. And will you be asking for the consultant to provide you with grant opportunities? What goals will you have? You should provide those goals to uh, in your RFP. You should also know how you're gonna use the report. Are you only gonna be asking for operational fixes because that's all that you can fund? Are you gonna be asking for um, capital suggestions? Are you gonna be asking for engineered capital projects? Uh, all of that changes within your scope. Um, make sure that the information that you put into your RFP and that you get out of your study is going to provide you with what you need to make grant applications. And then uh, bottom line, make sure that you are asking for benchmarking numbers because you need to know if what you're doing is actually moving the needle on your energy consumption. Um, keep this picture in mind. That's the Keith Anderson uh, community house here in Orono. And I'll be talking about uh, the results of our study on that a little bit later. So in Orono, we decided that we would do um, five buildings. We uh, looked at um, our newest building, which is our public works building, only eight years old, uh, which actually has a geothermal um, heating system. Um, and we went all the way back to our Keith Anderson house, which is old, old. Um, probably really hard to define exactly how old it is. 
Uh, we requested the ASHRAE level one audit, which is kind of a preliminary review. We would get suggestions, but not defined uh, return on investment numbers for um, projects. And um, we um, knew that we were leaving some of our buildings out because they had other projects um, and other plans already in place. So I just wanna look at what it is that we got from our um, study that this came back in uh, October. So we're now we're using it within our budget planning process now. Um, this is the Keith Anderson Community House. It was uh, once a one-story building and you saw that it's now two stories. It was actually raised, not added onto up above. Um, it's been a church, a school, municipal offices, and now it's a community house. I'm sure there's lots of buildings in your communities that have been through um, evolutions like that. Um, we received a table of our both our electricity and our gas consumption for um, 2019, which was our last year of normal usage. Hopefully 2023 will be a new year for us of normal usage. Um, and that the consultant then took that um, usage and compared it to other community buildings on a per square foot per year basis. And when they look at that and they compare that usage, you, you get an EUI, an energy usage intensity. And in this case, you can see that our EUI is an 84. That's not out of 100. Uh, it's just an 84. And compared to all other community buildings within the um, United States, that is ranked as a poor um, energy usage. So we know that we really need to make some improvements in this building. So we get a ranked priority improvements listing from the consultant. Um, you can read them. It's not really that important as to what they suggest. What's important is that you get, you consider what your pots of money are and how you're going to fund these changes. For Orono, we look at operational um, pots of money, a grant supported fund and a long range capital plan. Not surprisingly, most of the low cost uh, ranked priorities can be funded within our operational budget. These are things that can be done either this year or next year without increasing the burden to taxpayers. Um, we know that there are grant funds out there to install um, heat pump water heaters. So we're going to be looking in, into doing that. They also provided us with capital um, suggestions. So these are big projects. Again, not surprisingly, most of these will go on our long range capital plan and won't even be attempted uh, be between four and 10 years and possibly even a longer time span. Um, but there's also replacing that gas fired boiler with a high efficiency condensing boiler. Perhaps there's gonna be some grant opportunities out there. We're gonna still put it on the plan, but still look for the grants. So the takeaway from this really is that planning is a step that's often overlooked uh, when you're making improvements to buildings. It's uh, expensive, it takes time, and everybody's already an expert and knows or thinks they know what the plan is gonna tell you. Um, however, by taking the time to um, study, benchmark and prioritize your improvements, you can pluck that low hanging fruit while you wait for funding opportunities to do the bigger projects. Um, my final thought on this is that it is always better to be searching for grants to fit your projects rather than trying to um, fit projects into a grant opportunity that just popped up. And that's all I have. I feel like I should be taller. Um, I'm Doretta Colburn uh, from Waterford, Maine, and um, it says that I'm the chair of Pure Waterford, but I'm actually co-chair, so I have to credit my husband, who's the engineer and the numbers guy, and uh, that works uh, together with me, and we got this program going. 
I'm here to, to, I hope to bring some encouragement to, um, to all of you who are on the fence about how to go about making this happen. We, um, let me start with saying we decided in our group to focus on uh, the center of refuge, which is our firehouse. Um, it's, gosh, the emergency plan probably hadn't been updated for 20 years. And so that went back to using um, some facilities in our community that really weren't very adequate anymore to be able to be a center of refuge for people. And as we all know, um, climate events are happening at a, a more increasing rate. They are increasing in um, the effects they have on our communities, the, the recent floods that we had. Um, we still have several roads that are, are uh, detoured because of the washouts that have happened there. Um, we have a community of under 2,000 people, about 1,500, I guess, is the latest number. And we have uh, those in our community who are very vulnerable for a variety of reasons. And we felt that those are the folks we wanted to reach out to first to do something that can make a difference for them. So we decided that we would focus on our firehouse and our municipal building, which kind of extends out the other way where our town clerk is and our town meetings are held. And um, we put in heat pumps. I think it was about eight heat pumps altogether. Um, and we are actually working on solar now as well that we just signed a contract for solar. So that would allow this uh, firehouse to become a center of refuge that would be um, very meaningful for those in our community that really need that support as um, happened in December. The end of December, I'm not sure where you're living, but we ended up with two weeks in a row being out of power for several days. And that became an opportunity for people to gather there to, to uh, get support. Um, and, and because it's a central area in our community, it could be something that meets the needs of folks around our community. And it, we have networked with other organizations in our town to be able to be a support. Let me tell you the process a little bit about how this all happened. Um, we are called Peer Waterford, but before we even get to that, what happened is um, several years back in 2019, I decided with a, a friend in my community to begin climate conversations. The title is climate conversations. What can we do? And we would have different people from around the state come in and talk to us about climate concerns and do a presentation. And then we would gather around and talk about what, what, how does it impact us and what can we do here in our community of Waterford. And actually the, the people that came were from beyond Waterford. We have a friend that comes from New Hampshire um, who comes to be a part of those conversations. But anyway, what that allowed us to happen is I got this little email across my desk talking about this go pit program, this main won't wait program. And I turned to my husband, Ted, and I said, we have to find out. We got to get on that webinar and find out about it. It looks like it's something we might want to do. And uh, because we did, we decided to go to our select board and present that to them. We, um, we just, and then these, what we did is we talked about what this program was all about, how we can get these grants, how would they ever turn around free money, right? And that uh, we would do the legwork because all three of our select board members have full-time jobs. So we said, if you empower us, if you give us the go ahead, we will pull together voices in our community and we will go forward. Of course, we, we kept in dialogue with them. They had to sign off and everything we were doing, but they said, go right ahead. And we did. We, um, it was still, we weren't allowed to meet in person for some of that time yet. We didn't have facility because we were still dealing with COVID, the results of COVID. So we did a lot of it online. Um, gathered up the community by sending out flyers, by using social media, whatever it took to get the word out. And then we gathered several times to talk about the, the GoPIF program, to talk about the opportunities that were there, and then to prioritize what we felt was most important for our community, which ended up being our center of refuge. So it was about networking through the community and in ways that we uh, it benefited in so many ways. We got so many people involved. 
what this has done for us is improved our readiness to be there for people in times of crisis. Now, we didn't have to end up using our facility during the most recent flood, but we know, we know that time is coming and we'll be ready and geared up for that moment. It's built bridges in our community. I'm sure some of you out there might have a town where you have a north and a south, or you have an east and a west, or you have these, you know, the other side of the tracks kind of thing. And that has been historical in our community. And uh, we're beginning to break through that because we are able to see the benefit of what it means to work together. Grassroots organizing is possible. It's exciting and it's rewarding. And we have felt the benefit of this in so many different ways. It's been exciting to bring people together that even aren't sure of what we're doing or have different opinions, but that's what community is all about, right? And so we're thrilled with where it is going and where we know it will continue to go as we continue to grow Pure Waterford in our town. So we chose that name, Partners in Energy Efficiency and Resilience, because we thought it addressed really well what we are aiming for. And our local uh, neighboring town is deciding that perhaps they want to enroll as well, and they're going to borrow that peer Stoneham uh, name. So I have no know if they've enrolled yet, but they've talked to us about that. I want to end with Margaret Wheatley's quote, because I think that speaks to who we are. There is no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. Thank you very much for allowing me to share with you today. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine Lamb. I uh, would just like to start by thanking you all for inviting me to speak here and also for the Community Resilience Partnership for allowing all this work to get started and also to Dr. Sharon Klein, who made all this work possible. So uh, I'm the founder of the Sabai Resilience Committee, which we recently changed the name of to make it shorter. Um, <laughs> but our mission is to foster climate resilience and make energy efficiency technology more accessible to members of the Passamaquoddy tribe at Pleasant Point following community directed goals. Oh. Okay, so the challenge or my motivation for doing this type of work broadly lies in the fact that indigenous people often contribute the least to climate change but are often the first to experience the negative effects of climate change. And more specifically for Wabanaki people, the illegal taking of unceded land and water by the state of Maine has, uh, and the lack of control Wabanaki people have over their own natural resources has resulted in death and disease for those communities. So for example, like the concentration of lead, trihalomethanes, haloacetic acids, and other contaminants that cause cancer is very uh, high in the water at Sabayag and in other tribal nations. Uh, also, being a coastal community, it's Pleasant Point is especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change, like sea level rise, and also many people still follow traditional ways of subsistence, including fishing, hunting, and foraging, which exposes them to pollutants in the environment as well. Uh, Native American communities are underserved in the sector of energy efficiency technology, and many people don't have the financial resources to get those technologies installed. So we aim to fill that gap by providing access to that technology and other resources for members of Pleasant Point. So that was my mo main motivation for getting involved with environmental justice as it pertains to Wabanaki people. And then more personally, I first got engaged with this work working on a window insert build for Penobscot Nation with Dr. Klein, and we decided to continue on working together on various projects. So some of the obstacles that we had for um, starting the committee were uh, to building capacity. So the whole purpose of the committee was to build capacity for these types of projects. Uh, so for the first couple months, I was like half of the positions on the committee, and uh, I'm also a full-time graduate student, so it's been quite the job for me. And we started out with three members, and we now have eight members who are uh, who are awesome. So yeah, so getting people to participate and just community engagement is always a challenge. Um, so we started in 2022 by having a community resilience meeting where people voted for actions on the state's 72 item list. Um, and then we also had like food. Oh, yeah, never mind. Uh, then we took what people voted for at the meeting and made a list of possible projects. I forgot to go to the next slide. 
So first on the list that people voted for was weatherization. So we plan to do a window insert build this fall um, that would weatherize homes and save people uh, money on their electricity bills and save energy. So that's our main project right now. And we're in the process of recruiting people who need window inserts and exploring other methods of weatherization for homes. The second most popular was heat pumps for homes. Um, this is something we've applied for grants for already. And the third action was a community owned renewable energy or solar, solar installation for homes, uh, which we're also exploring grants for. Um, so as for the key to success, I would say is identifying key people in the government and the community that can help you along the way. So we had a lot of help from the environmental department and the housing department. Um, so having those contacts and forming those partnerships is a really big part of being successful and also identifying key people in the community who have the same values your organization has and that are dedicated and willing to contribute their time. So, so how is the outcome benefiting the community? Most of our projects are still in the planning or waiting to receive funding from grants phase other than the window insert build, but the benefits of the window inserts are saving money and energy for tribal homes. And we're hoping to, uh, during our window insert build in this fall, we're hoping to provide window inserts to over 20 homes. Um, so yeah, that will take uh, money off of their electric bills and save energy. In the future, we hope to continue decreasing people's electric bills and energy usage um, through community-owned renewable energy, heat pumps, and other projects like heat relating to heat mitigation and food sovereignty. So what did I learn through this process? Um, I wrote here learning by doing because I felt like I learned everything along the way. Um, I've learned how to run a committee, how to recruit people for a committee. Um, I've learned how to match up the priorities of the community at Pleasant Point with the language used by the state and other organizations that provide grants. Um, and I've also learned why community engagement is so important. So we try to conduct the Survive Resilience Committee to center and prioritize the wants and needs of the citizens. Um, and also I've learned not to try and reinvent the wheel because there are a lot of great existing opportunities and people who've done something similar um, that uh, where our main work is just raising awareness for those existing opportunities, such as Efficiency Maine. Um, so my advice for wanting to do, people who want to do something similar in their community um, would be to start with the citizens. So I would really recommend starting a citizen committee because they are citizens and they have the citizens best interests at heart and they know the needs of the community very well. Um, and even if there aren't many people in your community who are experts in climate or energy, if you find motivated people who are willing to learn along the way, then you can achieve your goals. And um, I would include people on your team that care deeply about improving the health of their community, if that's applicable, and that are knowledgeable about the needs of their community. Um, but yeah, and also that, um, even if you don't feel like you're in a place to do a project like this, or if you don't feel qualified, um, people thought this was really funny at the last conference that I'm a speech pathology graduate student. So it's not exactly, uh, doesn't exactly fit in with this, but if it's something that you care about and something you wanna do, then I would encourage you to anyway. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. Thanks guys. All right, good still morning, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be joined here uh, in a room with so many municipal and community leaders, some of which are my former professors that I do not owe homework to, which is really great. Um, my name is Ross Anthony. I am the Buildings and Energy Efficiency Analyst with the Maine Governor's Energy Office. And as Kathleen alluded to at the beginning, I wanna zoom out a little bit after hearing about these, these three different types of committees and organizations and projects and talk a little bit about resources, how to get started as a municipality and take advantage of both the state and federal programs that we have. So starting out, I do wanna mention um, the programs that are offered through the Efficiency Main Trust. We heard from the executive director, Michael Stoddard earlier today about electric vehicles. For those who may be unaware, but I'm sure everyone in this room is aware, uh, the Efficiency Main Trust is an independent quasi-state agency that was established to plan and implement energy efficiency programs in the state of Maine. Uh, they serve a, a wide myriad of sectors, uh, residential, commercial, industrial, where municipalities would fall in the more uh, non-residential side of energy efficiency incentives and rebates that are offered. Um, as Michael Stoddard mentioned, all of these resources are available on their site. 
So if there is one link to really take home from the resources that I'm talking about today, it's efficiencymain.com. Everything is going to be there, but I do want to walk you through some more specific rebates, incentives, and programs that are available to municipalities. Um, so whenever you go to the efficiency main site, you're going to see two tabs at the top. There's going to be one that says at home, one that says at work. And within at work, you can scroll down and you can see that, muni that the municipalities have a specific page for them. There's a page under the sectors uh, uh, portion of at work. There is a page for resources for municipalities. There are funding opportunities that are available for smaller municipalities, all of which um, you all can take advantage of within your communities. There's also a um, energy or a, a, a municipal lease that is available that is implemented through the Efficiency Main Trust. So again, some really great resources. And what you can use these resources for is, again, a wide myriad of different energy efficiency technologies, ranging from uh, HVAC. So you could do heat pumps, VRF systems. You could do uh, lighting and lighting controls and get LEDs installed in buildings. There are water heating solutions. Taking advantage of a heat pump water heater is a, is a really great way to reduce the electric bill that you have in your municipal sites. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to touch too much on electric vehicles, considering that we had an entire panel on it. But of course, the rebates for uh, those technologies are also available on that site. So how would you get started by taking advantage of these rebates and these incentives? Well, there's a couple of different ways. I've highlighted three that kind of stand out to me as the easiest way. The first one is a virtual customer consultation. It's a free service that is offered by Efficiency Main. Uh, they actually have a small pamphlet on it in the back, so I, I would encourage everyone to go and, and pick it up and, and take a look at it. But it's a really great way to talk to them and, and to, to kind of state what, what you're facing, what you want to uh, improve inside of your buildings, what do you want to decarbonize and make more efficient. Uh, you can also work with a qualified partner. They have a wonderful tool um, on their website that you can uh, uh, geolocate contractors and qualified partners that can help implement and carry out these projects. Um, and of course, uh, the, I had mentioned this before, uh, the, the municipal lease that is available through the site. Um, all of these are in just incredible opportunities for you to really get moving on a lot of these uh, larger projects that, that may be a little bit daunting at first, but with their resources, they really help guide you through and, and narrow in on what you need to do and how to do it. I also want to mention some of the programs that are avail available at the federal level. The first one it, uh, are tax credits and deductions that are available. The uh, 179D, that is commercial buildings and energy efficiency tax deduction. This gives you uh, up to about $5 per square foot of energy efficiency projects. There is the 45W that was mentioned earlier during uh, Michael's presentation. That is the commercial clean uh, vehicle tax credit. I was going to talk a little bit more about it, but he had this wonderful slide that had all the details. So I'll just say reference that slide. <laughs> um, and then, of course, with the uh, federal infrastructure programs, we have the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, BIL, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Both of these are incredible, incredible federal programs that are pushing money into the communities, into homes of everyone for energy improvements um, that are going to be uh, uh, available through all of these uh, different programs and opportunities. And I did pr uh, provide a link, main.gov slash BIL. This is a, a wonderful tool that, that really highlights Maine's efforts under BIL, both in transportation, uh, resilience and environmental protection, energy programs and building efficiency, broadband technology. It, it, it shows everything that we have done and taken advantage of as a state under the BIL. And you can start to see all these communities that are, that are utilizing these programs to advance what they need for energy efficiency, reducing energy burden, reducing energy cost, and as Kathleen mentioned, reducing the, the tax burden that would be on the uh, citizens to pay for these services. Um, within the IRA, as I mentioned, there are efforts that are underway for the programs that are rolling out. Things are starting to, uh, you know, we're starting to see a lot of RFIs and different funding opportunity announcements that are coming. And it's a very exciting time for you all as a community, as a municipality to engage. And you can also engage through programs like, the, like we are centering on today with the uh, Community Resilience Partnership. As you all, I'm sure know, uh, the, the Community Resilience Partnership with the CRP is helping to reduce carbon emissions, to transition to clean energy, and to increase climate resiliency. 
Um, so I would, uh, I'm, I'm not going to speak too much about it because I know that Brian's going to be talking a little bit about it at the uh, conclusion of today's conference, uh, but, but certainly want to encourage anyone to uh, take advantage of that program to enroll and to help your community and your municipality engage in all of these incredible resources that are available both at the state and the federal level to help decarbonize our communities and our future. Thank you so much. I told you we were lucky to have these folks with us today. Uh, wow. How do we meet infinite needs with finite resources? I think we have a formula here. Community learning, community networking, holding environmental justice at the core of everything we do, and a whole bunch of incredible resources all of which are linked in these present in these slides. Thank you, thank you, Ross, for doing that. Let's ask some questions. In the back. Okay, I'll try and project. Um, I'm really interested in how um, this group is thinking about significant increases in electricity costs and how that could impact heat pump installation. Speaking as a heat pump owner myself, it went from $300 to $600 to $900 a month to run our heat pump in the wintertime. And so this is a reality that we're facing at home and also obviously in municipal buildings. Just to make sure this is on, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, excellent. Um, that is a really great question, one that, that we have our eye on. We've been working uh, very closely within the governor's energy office and the efficiency main trust on what we have seen over the past year is unprecedented price and supply volatility of delivered fuels, which include heating oil, kerosene, and propane. These prices are, you know, orders of magnitude higher than they were in the past. And whenever you look at the cost of implementing and running those types of systems to really compare apples to apples, it's, it's, it's difficult to compare an oil furnace to a heat pump to, let's say, a natural gas boiler. So uh, the Efficiency Main Trust has a, a wonderful tool that is available, a home heating calculator that looks at the different uh, technologies, the different costs of fuel, and converts them to a dollar per MMBTU. Best way to think about that, it, is, it levelizes the cost for us to directly compare. So even with the increase in the, uh, the uh, standard offer through the uh, electric utilities in the state, the um, heat pumps are still outperforming in terms of price, the alternatives that are available. Um, furthermore, what we have seen with the increase and in kind of the, the uh, one of the leading rationales to the increase in the standard offer is New England, who operates in the ISO New England grid, their over-reliance on natural gas for the production of electricity. So as we start to see a lot of the uh, renewable energy projects that are coming online in the state, be it onshore or offshore wind, uh, solar or storage, we're going to see those costs drive down. Um, so really, as, as a region, we need to have um, a, a focused effort on reducing the amount of fossil fuels that we are consuming, especially for the generation of electricity, to drive the costs down. Um, all of that being said, uh, heat pumps are 270% more efficient than uh, something like an electric baseboard, so significantly lower costs. Um, that does not you know, necessarily stop the, the standard offer uh, from, from increasing in the past, as I have uh, mentioned with ISO New England's grid, but they are still the, the cheapest and uh, or the, the uh, uh, cheapest and most efficient form of home heating and cooling. So Orono has um, kind of taken two approaches to this. Um, I think now two years ago, we signed a net energy uh, billing agreement with a community solar project. Orono itself doesn't own any land where it would make sense to have a, 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 you know, a commercial solar array near um, a station that can actually handle the additional electrical load. So we weren't able to do our own project, but we were able to partner with an existing commercial project that was uh, in place. Um, we're also starting to look at um, solar again on the rooftop at the Public Works building. When we initially put in our geothermal heat pumps, it did not make sense to um, add solar panels because the cost um, differential wasn't there. We wouldn't get a payback on the solar panels fast enough. 
Unfortunately, I guess, with the rising energy costs, it now looks like solar makes a lot more sense for even um, smaller installations. So it's kind of it's one of those things where you have to keep revisiting uh, things that you've looked at before because the, the math doesn't always work out the same as it did in 2017. <laughs> Thank you. Another other questions? Yes. Is there any thought to linking a policy where there's a requirement for increased building efficiency before offering incentives for heat pumps or solar so that we're not throwing uh, energy out the window, so to speak, <clears throat> with these great new technologies so that uh, the electricity bills may not triple? If uh, if the building is efficient enough, uh, the the usage might not need to be as high to run the heat pumps, or so much solar power might not be needed. I have thoughts on this, but I see Russ too, so I'm going to let him talk first. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, the question was about whether we should uh, have thought about setting energy efficiency standards as a prerequisite for installation of heat pumps or, or for heat pump rebates. And Ross can, can speak to that. <laughs> Perfect. All right, my microphone. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, so building efficiency is, is a really interesting topic. Um, currently, Maine operates under New Deck, the Maine uh, Uniform Building and Energy Code. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were at the 2009 iteration of it. Newbeck recently adopted the 2015 version of it uh, in 2021. By statute, we are not allowed to be more than one cycle out of compliance. And since then, the 2018 and 2021 cycles have been released. So Newbeck is currently looking at adopting the IECC uh, 2021 set of codes. Uh, I, I call out IECC specifically because that involves the uh, energy conservation of a building. So we are actually looking at uh, building a, a, a new construction to a much higher standard uh, than what it was previously at. In terms of coupling it with different energy efficiency projects, you know, that's something that we always encourage you to do. Uh, if you put a heat pump in a home that has a giant hole in it, um, you know, it, it, it can not really provide the benefits that uh, they are intended to uh, provide. So by looking more at a, a comprehensive solution and finding ways to couple different rebate programs, incentive programs, federal programs, tax incentives, tax credits and deductions, the list goes on, finding ways to couple them and bundle them and braid them together, you're going to see, uh, you know, the, the, the most savings, both in terms of energy and carbon emissions. Thank you so much, Ross. I will also, just want to add that, that one of the things that I heard from, from each of our panelists was a, about the importance of listening to what is the what's resonating with your community. That was that was true. This panel was true, the transportation panel. Yes, there is a building science logic that makes sense, and then there's a community process logic that makes sense. And it, it's really important that we listen to where the, the interest and the needs are in a community. They're not going to be the same for anybody on this, this panel or anybody in this room, but we want to make sure that any step forward is a, a good step. Um, what else? Oh, yes, yes. Um, I have a question here from the Zoom participants, and that is who to talk to about a public library, which doesn't necessarily fall into a business. It's not necessarily a municipal entity, but it's a 501c3 often. Are there incentives or programs or folks who have experience working with public libraries? That's a great question, and it's probably different from, from town to town, because I know that our public libraries are really structured differently depending on where you are. But Ross, we're, we're making you do some heavy lifting on this panel. Do you, you know the answers? That is, that is a okay. You know, I would, uh, again, encourage that participant and really anyone in this room to visit the um, resources for municipalities, which will include those building types, um, and to schedule that virtual consultation with the efficiency matrix. They can really walk you through um, all the different opportunities, incentives, and rebates that are available. I'm not going to go down a long list <laughs> just for the last response, but they can really point you to all the different programs that will be available for, for that particular building. It's going to be a customized answer for each building and community. So 
Paul just said that in Waterford, our public library did have um, uh, heat pumps put in and got rebates. Excellent. Another question? Right here. One of the one of the things I noted in all the several of the uh, conversations here was the necessity to build uh, within your community consensus across you know uh, a wide range of political positions. Luckily, that's easy to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, I've been in, and I also know there was a couple of references to uh, window dressers as a uh, as one of the options that were uh, applied a very inexpensive way to uh, winterize a, a municipal building and over and above that a, 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 your home. I've worked with window dressers for about six seven years, and what that is is a volunteer organization that builds interior inserts that uh, greatly improve the energy efficiency of your uh, windows. Uh, and the cost per window is currently, you know, each each person that orders an insert is expected to provide some of work to do to build these. Costs about 45 bucks a window currently on average, as opposed to uh, maybe 10 times as much if you go to a commercial storm window. The uh, the biggest Im impact is what it does to the other problem, which is building consensus and building community. And one of the things we found in Belfast was that the very important conversations happen when you work together with someone across politics and religion, where that doesn't matter, and you, you uh, kind of share a meal during break time. And uh, the end result is, a, is a breaking down these barriers that are uh, built and are necessary to uh, you know, to, to break down in order to get funding and do these big projects. And so I, I'd recommend that if anybody that's interested, go to windowdressers.org and uh, look at what they do. It's been very effective here in Maine. It's now in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont also. And a tremendously interesting project. We need more of that kind of activity where people get together and work towards a common goal. Thank you. That's a pretty powerful uh, side benefit too. Uh, you get the energy efficiency and you get the, the community building. Um, I heard we've got a couple of experts on window dressers in the room, so you can, you can check out the uh, the website, but also track folks down. I'm just a I'm just a volunteer. <laughs> Kathy, I just like to say, Warren, I was hosted window dressers for several years, um, and. It never occurred to us to put them in our own municipal buildings. Like we posted the bills and it never popped into our heads. Oh, this whole room that we're doing the building, maybe we should put some, some of the inserts in. Um, but uh, he's 100% right. It's a great community building event. Um, their quality, they last for a long time. I highly encourage people to look into them, um, particularly if you own an old and gold um, as I used to. Bill, I love that reminder too, that even when we're really in the thick of it, we don't always see the, the ideas that are right in front of our faces. So that's where we come in to, to helping each other. Ted, yeah. Yeah, this is Ross. Uh, hopefully you have more information than I have. When the uh, IRA came out and identified the solar installations, it's gonna be unique towards a new option for municipalities and tribal organizations where you could potentially get up to a 30% bump up from the federal government as a direct pay. And we've been kind of searching the web and asking around and finding out if we could do some of that so we could increase the size of the solar panel we're putting at our camp. Have you heard any information you might have to help us look at that? My response to that is going to be a little bit of yes and no. Yes, and that I know that it exists, but I, I tend to focus on a lot of uh, behind the meter um, technologies and opportunities. So I'm not as tapped into solar, but I know that we have um, quite a few different people in the room that are part of the governor's office of policy, innovation, and future, and also in the governor's energy office um, that can likely uh, provide a little bit more information than I can. So um, I don't know if anyone wants to provide that or just seek us out afterwards or seek me out. I will find the right person for you. I mean, I will just say you're absolutely right. And I would say the IRS is currently about to release all the details, but there is an 
I mean, I would say a transformational opportunity coming in that most towns don't care about tax credits because they don't pay taxes. But what we're about to have is those tax credits are going to be called what's cash back. So towns that install clean energy projects, solar, there's storage, uh, there's also weatherization programs under that can actually get cash from the federal government uh, back. So I think it's a big, big deal. As we learn more resources, we will absolutely share it with all of you. Um, I think in a way we're, we're waiting to find out what's happening with all this federal money because it's kind of, there's big opportunities coming and the details are sort of slowly coming down. Um, but this is a big one and it could be actually a huge uh, savings to taxpayers, could be a reason to put solar on your roof and a way to pay for it. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel can talk about the interplay between electrification and climate resilience as it relates to storms. I know when we put heat pumps in our house, we kept the propane boiler so that we could keep the pipes from freezing in the winter. Are there other strategies to look at or like how are municipalities dealing with that when they look at public buildings and heat pumps? So I can say that um, in our uh, study that we did, um, a lot of the recommendations were to um, Pair a heat pump hot water heater with our existing boiler bed um, hot water heater so that we could actually shut off the boiler in the um, in the summer and use the heat pump hot water heater in the during the time. Um, and it's a good point that as you move towards um, something that's provided over the grid in a state where there's a lot of overhanging trees and ice uh, it makes it real hard to uh, keep that resiliency um, so that's certainly something that we continue to review and it's one of the reasons why we um, we have generators at the buildings we have um, backup sources you have to municipal operations can't just stop because um, bad weather has occurred uh, so there's a lot of backups, and it's a lot of reasons why they're not cheap. You got to keep going. And, and are you sizing those generators to handle your heating load? So particularly out at the public works uh, department, um, that generator is sized to handle, I think, half of the heating load, and then we have a backup um, heat source as well. Yes. On, with solar panels for homeowners, um, I don't know if this is misinformation, but now that PFAS and you know these chemicals are doing getting into our groundwater and all, um, is it true or not that solar panels, you know, over time are giving off some chemicals that might not be so happy to have on our properties? I don't have a quick answer for that, but I do want to thank you for, for bringing up that specter of misinformation and how, how thoughtful we all need to be about um, what we're hearing. So I want to do more research about that. I'm glad that we have so many smart, uh, smart folks in the room um, who can, can help us get to the bottom of it. I think we have time for one more question. Um, is there, well, storms and power outages and whatnot, um, is there any looking at developing microgrids in communities where there is some power generation, might be more brownout, <clears throat> but at least there would be something, and or specifically for community buildings so that they could supply water or whatever we were out of power for 11 days or, um, during the ice storm a while back. Um, and it inspired us to buy a generator, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but we have, we, it, it was only, how to get uh, water and bathroom facilities and, and whatnot. Has that come up in Orono or Waterford or in Sabayak? So 
So um, we have, when we designed our new library, um, which is, was not on the list of uh, buildings that we studied, that was meant to be a community resource. So we put in a, a generator again um, in order to be able to provide uh, res resources to community members when we did have um, outages. Uh, University of Maine, of course, is within our borders and we would use some of their resources. Um, the idea of developing kind of a microgrid, one of the things that we have talked about is even though our public works building is part of our net energy built uh, building agreement with um, a community solar project, we would be putting solar panels on that building that would be, in theory, offsetting the cost for other buildings. But in a um, outage situation, it would be able to provide energy directly to the building. Um, when I mentioned that we have um, limited resources and expertise with staff, that's one of those questions that, um, you know, in theory, we should be able to answer and consider, but it's just really hard to be able to, to know about that and check out library books and register your car and plow your roads, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that municipalities do and we do very well, but, um, you know, considering uh, microgrids is something that you have to hire an expertise for and hopefully maybe the state can help us with providing programs and um, like here's how you might walk through this discovery. Um, I would say, I would say for Pleasant Point, we have been looking into the microgrid for the community recently, and I'm not an expert on microgrids, but um, my boss, Dr. Jaron Klein, has been working on founding Local Leads the Way, which if I'm remembering correctly, it's it would get a bunch of different communities together into forming microgrids for their own communities. I probably launched it, but if you want to learn more about it, I would reach out to Dr. Sherry Klein. <laughs> and while this isn't necessarily about um, microgrids, I do want to point out the resiliency that's associated with, with heat pumps. There is some concern that with the loss of electricity during a storm or an outage that, um, oh, I'm not going to be able to use my heat pump, I wish I had my oil furnace. Well, Oil furnaces also rely on electricity. So whenever you don't have electricity, you can't use the oil furnace as well. So um, implementing from a resilience standpoint, something that is much more cost effective that allows you to put investments in something, for example, microgrid or storage or storage pair with solar or an electric generator would uh, really allow you to, to push that resilience forward. But to, to answer that question, there are co um, communities in Maine who are looking at resilience hub based microgrids. And there's several, I think Maine now has three different communities that have um, been enrolled in the Department of Energy's Energy Transition Initiative Partnership Program. And at least two of those have specifically used it, including the MDI community, to look at microgrid resiliency hubs um, that are powered by renewable generation. And I see, thank you, Joanna, and I see Dr. Klein in the back of the room. You got to jump in here. Thanks, I appreciate Jeff talking me up so much, but I did want to say that <laughs> Johanna is the founder of Local Leads, so <laughs> who just spoke right now. And I also, uh, just with the talk about window dressers, I'm on the board of directors of window dressers, and I've been working with them since 2015, so if anybody has any questions about that, that I can help answer. Thank you. Wait. I mean, how are we doing? We need to wrap up this this section, but I hope that you are all getting setting your sights on people you want to follow up with after our table discussions and uh, during the lunch meeting or lunch session. Thank you. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thanks, Lucy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the home stretch of what's been a great day so far. Uh, my name. Jeremy Bell, and I'm the Climate Adaptation Director for the Nature Conservancy in Maine. We're located in Brunswick. Um, so glad to be with you today and to uh, be introducing our crack team of panelists here for the uh, community resilience piece. Um, and to, to, sort of, to sort of kick things off, what I wanted to do is set the stage a little bit and, um, and reflect back to when I started with TNC back in 2014. Um, a couple of years prior to that, the state planning office had been dissolved. 
Um, so there is very little capacity at the state level for community planning and support. Although shout out to Judy's shop and the um, municipal planning and assistance program for carrying the torch during that time. What's that? Two jobs posted today. Talk to Judy. <laughs> uh, so um, fast forward four years, the Climate Council started. Turns out we all thought it was a really good idea to um, engage in community re resilience planning. And, um, and, uh, and so now what we have is the Community Resilience Partnership, which is a very well received program and very well conceived. Um, and, and the things that I really like about the program is that it's a unified approach to the support of planning and communities, and yet it's very customizable and communities can do with it what they want to do with it. And I think that's so powerful. Um, in addition, it really recognizes the rural character of our state and how stretched our municipal governments are, whether that's at the city level or at the, uh, at the small town level, um, and recognizes with a low barrier of entry to get people into the program. And I think that's such a wonderful aspect of the program. And already dozens of communities, probably a lot of you actually in this room, I'm guessing are involved with towns and projects um, as well. And so what we'll see from our presenters what I noticed when we sort of had a prep session is that um, all, these, all these communities have engaged in the partnership and yet the stories are very unique. And so back to that idea of this program being very customizable and um, community driven and solving the problems that your own community feels like are the most important and that flexibility is just powerful. And I think you'll see that in the presentations. And uh, so I'm not gonna read the lineup in the interest of time, but you can read it for yourself on the screen. And, um, and uh, that's our running order. And so um, I am gonna turn it over to Gabe and get us started. Thanks, Jeremy. Great to be here with everybody. It's always good to, um, there's a couple of people that I've met in person, even though I've been Zooming with them forever. And I'm like, oh my God, it's you, you're live. <laughs> Whoops, I was told don't go backwards. Great. Um, so I'm gonna tell you, hopefully a succinct story, um, the little community that could, um, in this case, the little island that could. So Vinyl Haven is an unbridged island. It's located 15 miles off the coast of Rockland. Uh, population is about 1300 year round. There are three main economic sectors on the island, um, fishing, lobster fishery, year round businesses, and then of course uh, the seasonal community. So the Vinyl Haven Downtown Improvement Project is a comprehensive infrastructure project that spans six tenths of a mile along the Main Street corridor. The project really began in 2014 when FEMA reissued their flood maps and that sort of propelled the community to do some studies around um, impact of sea level rise and storm surge on the downtown. And it brought up this question. So if we're going to invest in fixing aged infrastructure, how can we make our main street more resilient? especially resilient to climate and climate impacts. So in 2016, the town formed a master planning uh, committee that process resu resulted in a 2019 downtown master plan. And that really set goals for safety, accessibility, and resilience. The plan recommends 42 sequence capital actions, projects, and associated ordinance changes. And the infrastructure that it includes are the road, sidewalks, stormwater system, replacing a 1908 water main, improving the parking lots, the wharves, the boat ramps, uh, putting in some sewer climate adaptations, also a sewer extension and numerous other amenities such as benches and pocket parks. So when facing this project, there are really sort of two primary challenges. First, 
how is Vinyl Haven going to develop and manage this project with limited municipal capacity? And that's a story that most small communities can relate to. And another one that we all can relate to is how do we pay for this project without borrowing or raising taxes? Oh, I think I think I'm pointing the wrong way. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Very tech savvy. Okay, so thinking about those challenges, some main ingredients, um, I think there's sort of a couple of overarching ingredients to, to meeting those challenges. First, um, for Vinyl Haven, the town leadership really had a long-term vision. So they needed to have this long-term vision. They needed to have an appetite to undertake what is a multi-year, multi-million dollar project. And the other sort of overarching um, ingredient would be a commitment from the community. And we've heard a little bit about that today, how important that is, having things be community driven. So really the business and property owners were on board and they really needed to be on board to support the project for the duration and also to engage with the project throughout the process. So other important ingredients, developing a strong project team. So the town really had a commitment um, to doing this, they agreed to pay for planning and project support. That support would help them with developing and managing the project, but also writing and managing grants. A strong engineering team, also essential. So a team that had experience with large scale projects and also with managing federal grants. Of course, securing funding is a primary ingredient. So the town applied for multiple federal and state grants and you see the little circled $50,000 here. That's a community action grant that the town got to fund a low impact design stormwater system for the parking lot. And that also is serving as matching funds uh, for one of their federal grants. So also integral to securing funding developing those relationships with funding partners. And they also developed a relationship with a local funding partner, the Vinyl Haven Water District. And lastly, an ingredient, most, uh, most I wanna say most important, but certainly primary to seeing the project get off the ground, designing and engineering and implementing that project. What did it take? What does it take? A team of engineers, in this case for Vinyl Haven, really working to build in those resilient solutions that are gonna work for the Vinyl Haven downtown. So there are a lot of limitations in that area, including low-lying buildings and the proximity to the harbor. So finding a good, strong engineering team and working with them to engineer those solutions. So talked a little bit about ingredients. So the formula for success. So just thinking about that in terms of Vinyl Haven, this is Vinyl Haven's experience. How do we undertake this large scale project? What's our formula for success? So leadership and community commitment, a commitment to planning, to building resilience into this project, which could have just been a run of the mill infrastructure project, really committing to sticking to that project over time, having a very strong, clear community driven vision that's informed by studies and plans. So in this case, the master plan was developed with input from over 100 community members, businesses, organizations, and the project is based on numerous previous studies, including a sea level rise vulnerability assessment and a sewer climate adaptation plan, to name a few. We've heard this today, integral to the process, community en engagement, outreach, and constant communication. So a willingness from the town to invest in engaging the community, really ongoing community involvement throughout the design and implementation process. Oops, this is going a little haywire. All right, there we go. Um, and transparency and access to information, also key. And then the capacity to work with and sustain those relationships with funders over time and to bring in pro uh, project partners along the way. And this is really important, a commitment by the town to putting aside reserve funds that can serve as match for federal grants. And, and also I've seen this in other communities, although Vinyl Haven has not done this, uh, building a separate resilience reserve fund into the annual budget. So the thing I wanna leave with last is really um, one of the keys to success, I think for Vinyl Haven is that willingness to think beyond the construction project. So really thinking about the lifetime of the infrastructure uh, along with the ever-changing climate. So what does that mean? Sort of a commitment to budgeting 
to maintain that new infrastructure. So it's not a one and done. We're gonna maintain this infrastructure. The ability to plan for next steps during the implementation process. So not wait, but let's start looking now. Truly leverage this project to build more improvements and investments into the community and having an appetite to plan for what's next. So this is a 30 year infrastructure project. Let's start thinking now about the next capital improvement cycle. How high is the water gonna be then? How do we start planning now for what Main Street will look like in 30 years? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am Sarah Mills Knapp, the Director of Sustainability with the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Uh, I'm Tori Hill. I am the Community Development Director for the Town of Bridgeton. So we are here to talk a little bit about Bridgeton. There we go. <laughs> um, so the Town of Bridgeton, well, maybe you want to say a little bit about the Town of Bridgeton. <laughs> town of Bridgeton, um, we're a population of about 5,500. Um, and we're, we're a small community, again, limited capacity. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a planning office or an economic development office. We just have a community development. So um, having tools to uh, ease processes to make things you know, more resilient is a really big win for us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Bridgeton was part of the resilience pilot that was the pilot project um, before the Community Resilience Partnership uh, was created. And we had reached out to them because uh, GPCOG was specifically really interested to start thinking about what resilience looks like in our um, inland communities and especially, especially in smaller inland communities. Um, so it was a great place to start talking about it and thinking about it and trying to identify what values and priorities Bridgeton might have around resilience. So one of the things, um, that was surfaced during that process is the challenge of the capital investment process and how it's sort of a black box, which I think probably a lot of people here who may have been involved in one is feel the same way. Um, you know, there is kind of a lack of structure and clarity around what is considered um, in, uh, you know, looking through the projects that may be proposed in any one year. Um, you know, decisions are often based, uh, often based solely on cost and not other benefits that could be, that projects could be bringing um, that haven't really been identified or thought through. Um, and certainly I think in a lot of places, a lack of um, consideration of sustainability benefits. So that was something um, that was identified through the resilience pilot process of, of being a challenge for, for Bridgeton. <coughs> Um, so the process that I'm talking about through the resilience pilot uh, process, we created um, a series of workshops very sort of similar to I think what a lot of towns are now doing with the community resilience partnership. And it was a great way to start to think about, um, you know, the values and priorities that Bridgeton had. And one of the, the priorities, like I was talking about the challenge around understanding how to just get some more standards and climate considerations into the, the municipal processes that exist already. Um, and uh, Troy can talk a little bit about another priority that came out of that, which is a great example also. Sure, yeah. So um, Bridgeton was, was a pilot community, as Sarah said, and then we also enrolled in the partnership. So um, <clears throat> one of the, the biggest priorities that came out of our series of workshops um, was actually the loss of open space. And this was all in the wake of, um, you know, the pandemic and, and people were really focused on development pressures. Um, so <clears throat> we, uh, though we obviously welcome new development, we realized that um, without proper planning, uh, we can really jeopardize, you know, some of the critical wildlife habitat corridors and also um, corridors for recreation and open space that locals use and also bring tourism to our town. <clears throat> so, um, that's that's a huge economic driver for for Bridgeton. And so if folks were not excited about conservation, they at least could be excited about economic development. And so it was um, a very well received project in our town. Um, and we're, we're really excited to bring this plan to our board in just a couple of weeks, thanks to GOPIF, because they they funded the plan. Um, so it was really interesting to see, you know, one of the, we, a project that came out of the, the pilot engagement, you know, we identified priorities, um, and then we tried to think about what was a project that could help them 
uh, not just achieve, you know, any one particular goal like the open space plan, but what could sort of start to mainstream or involve um, climate considerations into all of their decision making processes. So um, it's a little bit boring, <laughs> but it's practical. And it's, um, I think, a good place to start, especially for communities who want to figure out how to kind of address sustainability um, in all of their decision making processes. So we developed a tool, um, a screening tool that is meant to kind of uh, be used as a project screening tool. So as you're going through any sort of, um, you know, decision-making process, it doesn't actually necessarily have to be investments, but uh, we developed it specifically for uh, both Bridgeton and Wyndham. Wyndham was also a, a member of the resilience pilot um, to use when looking at all of their projects. So um, we, these are kind of some high level considerations, equity and community well-being, environmental stewardship, infrastructure, technology, economic development, and, um, thinking about planning. Um, so we set some criteria at a very high level and then have a pretty detailed um, Excel spreadsheet, which does not lend itself to presenting uh, nice images of, but I will show you a picture. Um, and the hope is that both Bridgeton and Wyndham are going to use um, this screening tool in their investment decision-making processes. So what it does is it creates criteria and sub-criteria it um, allows the user to weight the particular criteria. So we wanted to create a tool that was flexible so that towns could really figure out how they might want to highlight particular values that came out of their priority setting um, processes. So open space is a really great example. Their open space plan is about to be done. Um, and we've been talking about how to use the tool to start to figure out what they want to invest in. So knowing um, that their open space plan has created, you know, a series of projects or priority areas, they could weight those more um, in the investment tool and sort of see what happens with the project. So you're meant to take a take a project, sort of run it through um, the benefit analysis, and then it will come up with a grade, a sort of, you know, a, a numerical value, which again is somewhat subjective. But um, so the criteria and sub-criteria are really meant to kind of touch on all of the sustainability benefits that could come from projects. And it also is meant to be used as a tool to help department heads and others think about how they could potentially improve projects that they have um, and think more deeply about all the sort of various criteria that we have in the tool. So Tori can talk a little bit about how they're thinking of using it and then can give you as an example for that. Sure. Um, yeah, so as Sarah mentioned, um, you know, capital improvement plans and, you know, capital budgets can be a bit of a black box. Um, and <clears throat> we don't have a, a specific criteria to how we choose things in that plan. And um, as you know, it may be difficult in a, a small community to get a new process um, implemented or even just a new step in a process implemented um, at a board level or a management level. But we do have a committee that is really enthusiastic about um, this tool. And it works perfectly for us because we are what uh, Carmeline County would call a set aside community for community de development block grants. So. Um, we have a, a high, low to moderate income population, and so we get about $200,000 each year um, to allocate towards projects, and um, about 130 of that is for infrastructure. So um, this, commu this uh, committee is actually dedicated to figuring out how to allocate those funds and how to spend that, um, that money. So having a tool like this is, is really great for us to be able to compare and contrast um, projects in ways that are not just based off of cost. And um, we're able to actually include factors that historically have been left out of the conversation. Yeah, we were talking before, one of the potential projects they're looking at is a sidewalk project versus maybe a pocket park. And Tori was saying, it's always the sidewalks that went out. And I said, <laughs> well, look, we can we can start to look at weighting some of the criteria that may be looking at you know um, priorities coming from the open space plan. So it is really meant to be flexible. Um, we're still sort of finalizing it. We're happy to share it with anybody and everybody who wants to use it. We'd love input on, you know, the criteria. It's really hard to include everything and no matter what, it's sort of um, picking and choosing, but I think it hopefully can be useful for thinking about how to improve projects and decision-making. So thank you very much. Right. 
Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nell Donaldson, and I'm the director of special projects in the planning department at the city of Portland. Um, and it's been great to hear the conversations today, and I'm um, very thankful for being here to be able to share um, some work we're working on. Um, so the project I'm going to talk about is a community action grant funded project that we have sort of just uh, gotten off the ground um, based on a lot of work we've done prior to today. Um, but uh, that we're calling the uh, Climate Resilience Zoning Project. And it's really an effort designed to integrate climate resilience into our land use code. So where we're allowing people to build in the city of Portland, how we're allowing them to build, what types of uses we're allowing people to, to put in any, on any given property in the city of Portland. And we're basing this work uh, loosely on models from across the country. There's lots of communities um, across the country that have integrated um, climate resilience zoning into their land use codes, uh, you know, stretching from Norfolk, Virginia to Boston and Providence and Cambridge, Mass very recently. Um, a lot of which are bigger than the city of Portland or all of which are bigger than the city of Portland, but uh, some of which share some similarities to us in terms of sort of age of infrastructure and buildings uh, sort of scale in some ways and form. Um, and so, uh, so we're learning a lot and uh, using that work to, to build our, our tool. Um, we all in this room obviously understand really well what the challenge is here. Um, uh, we did a vulnerability assessment in the city of Portland several years ago, and we know we are looking at more high heat days and a longer warm season. We know we're looking at more water and more intense uh, precipitation events. Um, we also know we're looking at sea level rise. Uh, there's a lot of blue <laughs> on that map. Um, and we're looking at storm surge as well. And what this adds up to for us, as well as for a lot of communities in, uh, represented in this room is um, lots of vulnerable property and lots of vulnerable people. Um, and in our case, uh, some of the most vulnerable areas are sort of right adjacent to downtown, right? This is our working waterfront. Um, this is a, uh, sorry, I'll, I'm gonna yell. I'm not gonna, I promise I won't move around that much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a census tract that has, uh, you know, uh, public housing in it and uh, lots of uh, uh, issues around poverty and access to resources. So um, we know we have uh, areas of the city that we, we really need to address this challenge in imminently. Um, and this is a widely held acknowledgement uh, amongst our city council. Uh, amongst the public for sure, and thus, uh, and thus amongst staff, our small but mighty staff uh, is up to this challenge. Um, and I say small but mighty, I know that lots of places have much smaller staffs than we do. Uh, we could all use more resources, right? Um, so there's wide awareness of the issue and wide acknowledgement of the issue. Um, in Portland, our sort of climate resilience um, and sustainability planning work dates back to 2007 with a sustainable Portland report that sort of like kicked, kicked off for the city, some of this sort of formal planning around climate and sustainability. Um, several years ago, uh, we engaged with the city of South Portland on a joint climate action plan. Um, that, that really uh, lays the foundation for the work that we're engaged in right now. So um, that plan called One Climate Future um, included the vulnerability assessment that I alluded to on the last slide um, and really laid the foundation for capital investment, for programmatic investment, and for policy action around climate change mitigation in the two cities, as well as adaptation. Um, and this uh, climate resilience zoning effort is a direct outgrowth of One Climate Future. So One Climate Future went into fairly good detail on what a climate resilience zoning framework would look like, what the geography might look like, what types of standards we might integrate into our land use code to really address issues of climate vulnerability or, and climate change um, through land use. Um, we're currently actually in sort of step four of this process. So we're starting to draft right now using the community action grant um, and building off of that work from, um, from One Climate Future. I can't overstate, everybody has hit on this theme, but how important uh, community engagement has been through every step of this way up to where we are now, and it will continue to be really important moving forward. Uh, One Climate Future included broad public engagement, uh, sort of education awareness building, but also coalition building around the, um, the recommendations that came out of that plan. Um, and so, uh, you know, 
again, broad engagement around what the vulnerabilities are and buy-in around what the solutions are. And as hard as it is to regulate land use, <laughs> because it is hard, no one wants to be told no on their property. When we have gone out and tested this concept um, with the public in the last six months, generally we get really broad support. Um, people say, yeah, we shouldn't be building a congregate care facility in Bayside, right? Like we don't want a hospital or a clinic uh, in an area that's gonna be underwater in, uh, in, a, in 50 or 100 years. So um, the rubber will meet the road when we actually send the checks out to people, but so far so good. Um, and I think that's really about the public engagement we've done so far. So um, the climate resilience zoning um, framework, uh, this is in a nutshell, how we're anticipating it will look. Again, this is coming right out of One Climate Future. And uh, the way it's being framed is sort of a two pronged approach. One is about resilience citywide, recognizing that the whole city has a role to play in sort of absorbing impacts um, around high heat and stormwater in particular. So we um, expect that this element of the zoning framework will be integrated into our existing site plan ordinance, um, which already has a lot of standards around stormwater and wetland fill and tree planting and landscape. But what we're anticipating doing is sort of uh, dialing up all of those elements of our site plan ordinance to make sure that we're really addressing high heat and um, and water, storm water on a sort of consistent and uh, cohesive uh, sort of scale. So we're talking about uh, landscape standards, tree planting. Um, we're talking about cool pavement and cool roof standards. Um, we're talking about uh, better standards around capturing and infiltrating storm water across the city again. And, uh, and also sort of more aggressive standards around well and fill where it will really will make um, make a difference. And again, we're sort of anticipating that this will be this will be about new development and and reconstruction projects. So things that are uh, addressed through our site plan ordinance. And then at a more targeted level, um, there will actually be the sort of uh, flood resilience element of the zoning framework. And this is those red areas that appeared on the map uh, in the first slide that I showed. And this is, a, this is uh, in all likelihood a more targeted set of standards around things like use. Um, so regulating what can happen on the first story of buildings uh, throughout those areas that we expect inundation to happen. And uh, really we're uh, anticipating saying, no residential use on the first floor, no medical on the first floor, no congregate care. These really, again, vulnerable um, uses that we really don't want to be in harm's way in the next uh, 50 to 100 years. Um, there's also likely to be uh, flood proofing standards, um, standards around elevating mechanicals. So we're making sure that those are not underwater, uh, elevating the ground floor of, of new build um, within these zones, and then uh, additional standards around for preserving those elements of different uh, sites that can absorb uh, absorb the water when it comes. Um, so uh, as I've alluded to a couple of times, we're working through this approach right now. I wish we could say we we're at like the ninth inning, but we're at like the third inning. Um, but, uh, but it's really exciting work. Um, and again, all indications are that, um, that there's, a, there's a lot of support for this work moving forward. So we'll be testing um, sort of finer grain details around this in the next couple of months with stakeholders. And then we expect a formal review process through our city council, planning board, et cetera over the coming year. So stay tuned next year at this time, hopefully we'll be done and everybody will be flood proofed. <laughs> um, pass it over to you, Alan. Good afternoon, my name is Alan Prance and I've had the great pleasure to be the service provider for a full year that ended in uh, March of this year, a service provider for five towns on the Blue Hill Peninsula, Brooksville, Blue Hill, Brooklyn, uh, Sedgwick and Penobscot. I'm also currently the uh, coordinator for Blue Hill Peninsula Tomorrow, which includes those five towns plus Castine, uh, Surrey, uh, Stonington and Deer Isle. So um, we have a lot of work going on and Brian asked me to talk today about the whole issue of the wastewater treatment plant in the town of Blue Hill. Uh, you saw the video this morning, you saw Dr. Nick Nadeau, the town administrator, talk about how important this project is so that, as he said, we're not standing in sludge. And um, I think that um, 
this is a very uh, active uh, clicker here, uh, has a life of its own. So um, really, I wanted to talk about the importance of this uh, wastewater treatment facility, even though it's located in the town of Blue Hill. It really has regional implications up and down the peninsula because um, right next to this uh, wastewater treatment plant is the regional hospital. Blue Hill is the home of two supermarkets, two building supply stores, two pharmacies. It really is an important facility to protect against storm surge, um, high tides, sea level rise. It's an aging facility. And uh, you've heard uh, earlier speakers talk about having, a, Gabe talked about having a 30 year capital plan on Vinyl Haven. Luckily the town has a 30 year plan and uh, 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 dollar figures, uh, aspirational dollar figures to match to resolve that issue. So I'm uh, going to talk now about how we uh, together secured $6 million of funding. And um, that was a process that really entailed thinking about um, three things, thinking strategically, uh, working with our funders, and then working to build uh, community support. You've heard those themes throughout the day here today, and I think that's, uh, I'm going to certainly reiterate that. But Brian asked me to talk about how we stacked up funding for this project. Um, actually, the story is um, even better than that because we um, wasn't just stacking up pancakes, it was really using the whole dynamic of leverage, using one grant award to open the door to leverage the next one coming through in a mutually beneficial ecosystem of, um, of funding. So uh, the first uh, $1 million came from the congressional directed spending. Uh, actually, um, in the House side, it's called uh, community uh, project funding. We were recommended, or let's just do the word earmark, congressional earmarks. That's the word that we've uh, all known about from years past. It was Jerry Golden's office who suggested to us that we apply for money uh, for a million dollars. And um, the uh, suggestion came with a thought, you know, the application deadline is coming up a week from now. Um, you know, no harm. That was good. Maybe you want to think about it next year. Uh, well, we decided um, Blue Hill won't wait. And uh, we went ahead and we got an application together. Uh, we um, submitted it right on deadline and we're very happy to hear that Jerry Golden's office out of 132 applications that came in, ours was one of 15 that was selected. And what we learned was that one of the keys to getting it that far into the process and all the way to uh, through the appropriation subcommittees was the fact that we had generated 17 letters of support from every town on the peninsula, all nine towns, uh, town resolutions, letters of support from businesses and individuals. So that was really an important part of, of our process. The next um, grant for a million dollars was from the Maine Infrastructure Adaptation Fund. I think we all recall that one of the strategies from Maine Won't Wait, one of the uh, outcomes, one of the recommendations of the, the working group, I think, Judy, you were the co-chair of the working group that recommended the uh, Maine Infrastructure Adaptation Fund. It was established last year and uh, for one-time funding of $20 million. We applied for a million dollars out of that and were awarded that. There was a very interesting interplay here and I mentioned the importance of strategy and thinking holistically. The um, program was administered by the Maine DOT, by Maine DOT, and one of the requirements, or one of the requirements, was that there be a local match. The, the local match was five percent, but this was very important for communities that were enrolled in the Community Resilience Partnership Program. The match was only two point five percent. So you might guess that uh, Blue Hill very quickly got enrolled and qualified for the two percent, two point five percent, rather than the full five percent. The next uh, uh, influx of money came from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I know you know whenever I mention this to anybody outside this room, people think USDA. How does that have anything to do with wastewater treatment plants? But as we all know, and there's been plenty of information at the back of the table in the exhibit today, the Rural Development Program does fund infrastructure projects, many of them, including wastewater treatment plants. So that funding actually came in, in the form of a hybrid. It was a uh, financing, excuse me, it was an outright grant fund of $1.25 million. The rest of it was $2.75 million in the form of a low interest loan. So it was a mix of funding and financing. And uh, I would point out that 
this was the result of an investment that the town had made uh, many years earlier in hiring Olver Associates. That's the firm that actually operates the wastewater treatment plant. And it's the firm that also has prepared a 30 year plan, capital budget, cost estimates, staging, engineering, design drawings. So when we were ready to uh, apply for congressional directed spending, we used that research. We used that same research for the infrastructure adaptation fund. And the fact that we had applied for those, I think, was part of going into what I call, as I said before, is this virtual ecosystem of mutually supporting applications that go in. No funder wants to be alone. They all want to have, uh, obviously and understandably, evidence that everybody else, there are other people in the, in the, in the, in the game as well. So I think the insights that I would uh, provide here uh, that we learned on the peninsula are really that um, funders, uh, staff, program officers really are our friends. They provide good advice. They're eager, in fact, for us to uh, benefit from the programs that they administer. So staying in close touch is very important. Um, in Blue Hill Peninsula tomorrow, we have, as I said, a monthly meeting, Zoom meetings of our elected and appointed officials, town leaders. And at every one of those meetings, we have, um, they've chosen to be there, staff from Senator King, Senator Collins, and Representative Golden are regular attendees. They get gold stars for attending every meeting. And if they can't come, they send it to somebody else in their stead. And uh, this is a great way for them and for us to stay in touch with what's happening in the federal funding scene. We also invite state officials to those meetings as well to learn about what programs are available. So that's really an important point, uh, getting advice, staying in touch with our funders. And then thinking strategically, uh, we've heard speakers throughout the day talk about the importance of making sure that funds work together so that they, we're not just chasing funds, we're not just looking at one fund because it's available, we're looking to see how they all fit together as a cohesive, self-replicating, self-fulfilling package, self-perpetuating package. And finally, I would say that um, the, the other learning that we had is that community engagement is important, and in fact, it's fairly easy. Once members of the community understand the importance of the project, they become ready, willing, able, and even eager to support that sort of uh, and, uh, advocacy, really becoming a constituency of advocates. It's really an important part of this, this whole process. And I would say that as daunting as it might seem to put together a a uh, resilience plan for an aging uh, climate-threatened wastewater treatment plant or any similar uh, situated facility in your own community, as daunting as that may be, um, our learning was that once we got in the process, collaborating with each other, working together, we really got into the process. Uh, we really learned that funding, finding $6 million was easier than we at first thought. So I guess the takeaway is, get into the process, and then you'll really get into the process. Thanks, Alan. So my name is Martha Shields, and I'm going to be talking about how the New England Environmental Finance Center can provide some free technical assistance to access the unprecedented funding and financing that is now available for projects like the ones you just heard about. If you don't know the Environmental Finance Center, whoops, oh. <laughs> Okay, hold on a sec. What did I do? <laughs> Does anybody know what I just did? Um, okay. Uh, if you don't know anything about the Environmental Finance Center, we are the Environmental Finance Center for EPA Region 1. There are Environmental Finance Centers for each EPA region across the country. And EPA Region 1 is consists of uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. We've been in business since 2001. We are part of the University of Maine system at USM in Portland. We are 100% grant funded, mostly from the EPA Office of Water. 
And our focus in general is on climate change um, and climate resilience projects. Um, as you can see, our mission is to provide innovative funding and financing solutions that helps all kinds of communities, uh, states, tribes, local governments, nonprofits, community-based community organizations, and the private sector to pay for climate resilience projects. And the biggest barrier to overcome in communities is low capacity, as we've heard from the other speakers, to find the, the correct grant and also to apply for the grant and then to manage that grant and um, for the life of the project. So any EFC is what we call ourselves. We provide that free technical assistance to bring communities to the funding and the financing table. And we actually provide the capacity needed for some communities to go through that process. And in the process, we build the capacity of those communities so that they don't rely on us to do it again and again for them. Okay, now I'm going to do it properly. <laughs> so the speakers in this session talked about the approaches and the strategies used to move their projects forward in the stages that it takes to get to the implementation phase where they can actually build their projects. The assistance that these technical assistance providers gave is critical to doing that and going through that process. Communities that are here in the audience may be wondering where to go next and what resources there are available to take advantage of to move your own projects forward. Oops. So when I said unprecedented um, opportunity for funding and financing, it really is unprecedented. The money that is out there from the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. EPA Office of Water has called it the single largest investment in water infrastructure in U.S. history. There is a total of $974 billion over the next five years, and the EPA Office of Water is getting $50 billion of that, mostly channeled through the states in the state revolving funds. States have clean water state revolving funds and drinking water state revolving funds. And they are set up to be a partnership with the federal government to the states to improve drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure. The um, clean water state revolving fund is a program. It's a federal state partnership, like I said, that provides low cost financing to communities for a wide range of water quality infrastructure projects, including waste, wastewater treatment plant uh, infrastructure upgrades. So Alan, maybe your next pot of funds could come from the SRF for Blue Hill. Also for non-point source pollution control, which is basically stormwater, decentralized wastewater treatments, which is septic. Uh, stormwater runoff and mitigation, including green infrastructure, estuary protection, and water reuse. The Drinking Water State Revolving Fund is not only for drinking water infrastructure like um, filtration plants, but also for lead pipe detection and remediation, emerging contaminants like PFAS and other uh, contaminants, and also for source water protection. So that gets into the realm of conservation and um, buying up land to conserve your drinking water source. Um, the, the point that is really important to know about the BIL is that there is a special um, focus on helping environmental justice communities, those underrepresented, under-resourced and low capacity communities that have never come to the funding table. And just in the um, clean water of both in the clean water and the drinking water SRF, there's a mandate that 49% of the funds have to go to underrepresented communities. Uh, they call it disadvantaged communities for drinking water and they call it affordability for clean water, just as a, um, a nuance there. Um, so this slide um, shows you that um, the, the opportunity for the next five years is that the New England EFC has been awarded to become an infrastructure environmental finance center 
for the next five years. And um, we're calling our program the New England Water Infrastructure Network because it's not just the New England EFC. We're kind of a small group. There's only seven of us. We just put out a, um, we're gonna be putting out a job description for two more people. So um, if you know anybody, send them our way. But besides our small staff, we needed to make sure that we had the capacity to help communities through a wide range of um, needs. And um, we have five core partners that we are gonna be subawarding and contracting with who are specializing in either um, engineering technical assistance or finance, financial assistance, and even assistance to, to uh, entities like uh, manufactured home parks, where they have a re established relationship so we can work with these small underrepresented communities more effectively. Um, we are also now part of the um, Environmental Justice Thriving Communities and Technical Assistance Network. A grant was just given to University of Connecticut for EPA Region 1, and we're going to be a sub-awardee to that. So that, that will allow us to identify these underrepresented small communities that need the most help in a much more quick way. And under that grant, we'll be able to give assistance other than for water infrastructure, we'll be able to give assistance on whatever needs they need for climate resilience. Um, the ultimate goal of all this work is to help communities access the state revolving funds for, like I said, drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. And there is a continuum of services that we can provide under this grant. And we will tap into our other partners that I mentioned for things like lead service line identification and for um, like mobile home parks. Um, and um, there is also a lot of other grants that um, communities are eligible for. There are lots of flyers in the back that the DEP table has, but I'm focusing on this because this is really actually the single largest opportunity now for every community. I can't think of any community that does not have a water need of some sort, whether that's a huge infrastructure project for a wastewater treatment plant or it's a tiny mobile home park that just needs assistance to get to the funding table. Um, this continuum of services that you see here ranges from partnership and engagement to planning and assessment, project development, funding and financing, actually holding their hands through the application process for the SRFs, which is not an easy thing. Um, even for us, we're learning a lot about that now. Every state is different. Every state has a drinking water and clean water SRF, and they all have different rules. And um, we have to help uh, six states go through that. Um, about the project construction and management, we can't really provide the engineering services, but we can um, help communities find pre-development funds and consulting engineers that can get them through that process so that they can develop their engineering and, and design so that it, they're ready for the funding table. Um, we're going to be working with uh, many communities in the next five years. Our goal is to work with 30 communities in the first couple of years and then increase that over the five-year period. Um, and the most important thing I want to say about these SRF funds is that there's all this money at the SRFs, but this money also comes with this free technical assistance. So I would urge any community to call us and see if you qualify for services. There's gonna be a lot of coordination that needs to take place between um, the state SRFs and also EPA Office of Water who have their own lists. And um, the last thing I wanna mention is, you know, how can you get in line for this service? On our website, we have an intake form. EPA Office of Water also has an intake form. And those are, the, um, um, those are the forms that we're going to be working with to prioritize which communities we work with first. And then we'll also be identifying communities through other partners that have actual relationships with these uh, environmental justice communities, because that's the whole point, right? They're, they haven't raised their hand in the past. They're not going to be raising their hand now and filling out an intake form. So we're going to be working with um, entities that actually work with EJ communities to identify who needs the most help 
and um, we'll be bringing um, assistance to them. And I'll turn it over to Jeremy now. Great, thanks to all the presenters for that great information. And uh, before we kick off the Q&A, I just wanna reflect on the, um, and, and go back to that initial idea of the different types of projects and all these different planning um, uses of the uh, community action grant, um, you know, seed money for the wastewater treatment and, uh, and the bucket loads of cash, Martha, that you uh, seem to have access to. And I, I think that idea of using the uh, community action grant as seed money for something much bigger is such an interesting idea. Um, and, uh, and so, um, well, we should think about that. Um, so moving on to the Q&A, we have 15 minutes, right, Lucy? Okay, so great. Are there questions for the presenters out in the audience? Yeah, Shri. Yeah, Shri, please, please do stand up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, zooming in. No, can't see that far. Thank you for an amazing presentation. All of your uh, presentations are very inspiring. Alan, I have a question for you. Uh, for another set of communities interested in kind of banding together, I heard 17 towns working together. That is amazing. What's the formula to do that? So, um, Blue Hill Peninsula is one actually of nine towns. So, 17 letters of support. Oh, okay. um, 17 figure. It really began with um, um, I served on the Blue Hill, excuse me, I served on the Brooksville Comprehensive Plan Committee, Sea Level Rise Committee. We decided that um, to get some good information, we talked to our colleagues in Blue Hill, some of whom are here at the front table. And when we talked with them, we decided that um, they've done a sea level rise report, decided that, gee, there's a lot to be gained by talking to other communities. So it grew like that. And this was a very informal process at the beginning. We got funding from the Island Institute, as well as some private um, donations that provided a match to the Island Institute's uh, startup funding. We also gained some funding from the United Foundation. Uh, to continue that coordination. So that's how it began back about um, a year and a half ago. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Okay, anyone else questions? Yeah, you have two, and I'll get to you next. Raise your hand again, I'm sorry. So, okay. okay, thanks, I'll get to you. Thanks, I've got two questions from the Zoom, and I think these are probably best for Martha, but for anyone. Um, we have folks on the Zoom wondering if there's funding available that would cover things like individuals' wells going dry due to drought, which is a climate concern that folks are facing, and similarly that might be available to a town to estimate quantities of water available in an aquifer. Um, and so people are thinking about specific types of funding. Thank you. Uh, the state revolving funds do not, as far as I know, uh, have any funds for that kind of, it might qualify as a pre-development fund. Um, I have to check that, but um, it would be the first step in trying to get to the, uh, you know, implementation phase of doing something about it. So I can definitely check, and every state is different, so I have to check 12 rules, <laughs> but I will do that. Thank you. Is there another question? Yes, there was another. No, those were them. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, back. Um, so we're kind of running into a situation where there's so much grant money coming out so fast that it's more than we actually have the staffing to implement. So I was wondering if any of you have encountered, you know, Public Works Departments or the treatment plant just saying, we don't have enough people, we're going to have to pass this by, and how you're uh, facing that. Well, the BIL is going to be available for the next five years, so it's a matter of prioritizing what you need to do first, and there's the tool that GPCOG has, and there are other tools as well that can really help prioritize what to do first, and then to really keep in mind that you want to take advantage of these big funds before they go away. We don't know if it'll be renewed 
after five years, but I would I would say that it even though it seems like it's overwhelming to do all this at once, it's really important to try to position yourself so that at some point you can take advantage of these big monies. And, and like I said, like 49% is not a loan. It can, it can actually just be a grant if you qualify for, for that. Um, if, you're, if your demographic qualifies you for a uh, principal loan. So I would say don't pass this by. It's really unprecedented. And there is this technical assistance that can, you know, Help you figure out prioritization for one and help you figure out like when to when to do this before it's before it's gone. Any other presenters? Uh yeah, just to put in a plug for regionalism. Um I think we hear this all the time from a lot of our communities that it's just too much and it's all at once. And so I think one of our roles, and there are lots of you know, regional organizations or regional support where you know, I think group banding together, and I think that's the great thing about the community resilience like partnership that you can, um, you know, apply as a group of communities. So it's sort of really lessens the load to do that. And I think reaching out to regional planning organizations or uh, regional coordinators is a really great way because you, you know, we've all heard a lot of communities talking about similar types of problems. So, if, um, you know, really the best way I think to reduce the burden um, of a lot of these funding <laughs> sources is try to work together. Um, to really access the funding sources together, which I think, you know, Alan has a great example of that. So I think that's one of the, the solves, at least right now, you know, we're all, I definitely feel like we're drinking through a fire hose um, in terms of the amount of money, but I think that is one way at least <laughs> to try um, to band together. Yeah, and definitely, like, there are there are plenty of uh, service providers, uh, not necessarily the community resilience uh, partnership service providers, although they may be one and the same. There are folks available to help. And as Sarah uh, said, you know, your regional planning um, office or your uh, community resilience partnership regional coordinator, we can put you in touch with folks. Um, we can provide some capacity as well. And I think, you know, helping to look for funding sources, as, as Martha mentioned, you know, technical assistance is available at no charge. So um, there are also grant opportunities where um, you can get some uh, of your costs covered for services that you um, incur prior to receiving that grant. So try to work with someone who can match you with the right funding source that is going to meet your needs in terms of the capacity you have to manage that funding source. Um, and then also helping keep helping you look for realistic options to, to help you get the work done because you can't do it alone. No one can do it alone. It's impossible. Um, so finding that team, and I think, you know, that's where turning to your regional planning organization, a service provider, engineering firms are also a great uh, source of assistance there as well, and your regional coordinators. Okay, Judy. So I, I love the fact that I didn't have to say any of that because that's what I wanted to say. But I just, for the person on Zoom about the aquifer, the assessment of a regional aquifer, um, I would recommend that they contact the Maine Geological Survey for technical assistance because uh, that's highly site specific and they can get their questions answered um, in a Maine grounded um, set of data. I would just add real quick to that, um, and someone's going to have to tell me where the, is it DEP that has capacity development grant? Who has the capacity development grant? Which department? The Clean Water Program at uh, CDC. Uh, it has, um, we have the Clean Water SRF at DEP, but it only covers um, uh, public infrastructure. So the question about private wells is right. not covered under DEP, under our the Clean Water. Um, but I did just give Jess a link to some resources about private well owners that's come up in conversations about drought um, that Maine Emergency Management Agency has. So I think she just added that to the resources. Great. Okay, Parker. Yeah, thanks so much for your presentations. I have a question about the the amount of time and you know ultimately staff time within these planning groups or local community group that is required to submit an application and track the progress and do the reporting on the grant. Um, 
that ostensibly takes some of your like the people closest to those projects it takes them into this world of reporting rather than doing the on the ground work and so all of these things are important how would your work with communities change if there was a more of a common app approach for resilience projects or if there was a service that became institutionalized at a statewide scale maybe related to martha some of your team's work but that was a grants assistance program to help municipalities. How would your work with those community members shift? I mean, I give you all the money in the world. Yeah. No, something like that. I think it sounds really useful. It's, um, I mean, I spend all my time doing those things. So I think it's certainly for our municipal members you know, they are our municipal staff. They're so close working on the ground. And um, I think one of the challenges is like the further step to get away from that on the ground work, the harder it is to like wrap your hands you around what's happening and really to like report on it. So I think that could be a challenge. But um, yeah, I think two thumbs up. That's a great idea. And I don't think you would have more like mix. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if that was possible, I, I would think that's that's a great thing. I think um, you know the regional planning, you know, uh, places do provide some of that assistance already, and that's why we need on GPR so much because they do help us with these types of projects. Um, I mean, but to credit the CRP, it is um, it's not a burdensome grant at all, and um, it does allow you to really be out um, in the field doing the work that, that you want to do. It's it's not a huge load um, comparatively, which I really appreciate. Yeah, I think we see the challenge certainly at the federal level, at the federal level grants of being so burdensome. Um, and I think that, you know, there are ways to reduce that. Like the more you do it, the easier it gets. So there is like a, you know, efficiency in managing a bunch at once. So as <clears throat> you know, regional planning organization, we do a lot of that work for our members to be fiscal hosts, but I totally understand that not all regional planning organizations have the capacity to do that themselves. So I think that is a big challenge across the state. Um, yeah, and I think Parker, uh, three cheers for bringing that up. Um, I think that, and Jess can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is part of um, recommendation through um, equity subcommittee of just you know streamlining and having one port of entry um so it's not like a continual process of providing this same similar information over and over again so yeah definitely would be a huge barrier lifted for a lot of communities and as um Tori mentioned you know the, the community resilience partnership grants really do eliminate so many barriers um, to applying just in the in the, the when the, the grant is set up and who can access it and um and the reporting even is is just so much more simplified and user friendly. So yeah, anything that can be done to um just uh take the equation of limited capacity um I guess take that out of the equation as much as possible. Of course it's like a no-brainer. I would, I would add to that, to taking the, uh, the burden or lifting the burden, I think it's very important when we write grant applications to include a line for project administration, so that mm. can uh, help uh, the implementation and the reporting. Great. Um, Jess, first, I'll just get Thanks. I have one more question from the Zoom world, um, and this one's about the capacity challenges that we're bringing up. And whether or not the panelists are familiar with any on ramps for people coming out of high school or college or early career who want to fill these capacity grants but don't have any experience at all. So, how do folks with no experience who might want to step into these jobs get kind of get a sense of what's available, get a sense of what the career looks like, and then get training to be able to do this work? Um, I have a great offer for that person. The, uh, the Greater Portland Council of Governments closed an America program. So, we have uh, we just got renewed for the for next year. We have up to 14 open spaces every year for a one-year placement for an AmeriCorps fellow um, to work really mostly on sustainability, um, wide range of sustainability projects in our region. So we place them with municipalities primarily, but also with nonprofit organizations and internally with us 
at UB Cog, um, and it has been an amazing, amazing resource. Um, you know, primarily a professional development program, but it also is a capacity building program. We have hired a lot of the fellows. Um, a lot of them come with you know degrees or master's degrees already. It is a huge help. Um, we have one placed in Yarmouth. We have one. Um, in lots of different news colleagues and nonprofits, and it's you know it's like a full time um, placement for a year. So I think programs like that are a great way to get a ton of experience and a lot of on the ground experience with a wide range of issues and to make connections. So just a plug for that program. And I think if someone, um, you know, is at a very local level um, and you're coming out of high school, if, you, if you're if you eligible to serve on a municipal committee that's doing a lot of this work, maybe you have a climate action committee, maybe you have a sustainability committee. I mean, uh, volunteer committees, as we hopefully all know, provide a huge amount of capacity. And the fact is, like, you're, you're likely not in there with a bunch of technical experts. Maybe you are, maybe you're not, but it's just like you can really do a lot of, um, on, you know, on the ground learning. So, and it's very forgiving um, because, you know, you're there as a volunteer. And I've seen also with a lot of um, communities, folks that start acting in a volunteer capacity, they can, you can find funding, you can work with that municipality to find funding and hire um, a person on, you know, even as a, on, as a uh, contractor, so a contractual basis, or providing stipends for the work that that volunteer does above and beyond um, their, their uh, commitment to the committee. To supplement what Dave is saying, I'll just mention that both the Island Institute and the Indian Foundation one of the conditions of funding Blue Hill Peninsula tomorrow was that we provide career development training for somebody. So this is something that's being recognized by funders as well as people looking for this sort of career development. And I'll just really quickly highlight, uh, I look around this room and I see numerous island fellows from the Island Institute, so highlighting that program as well. It's a two-year community-based placement uh, and we encourage the applicant to, or the interested party to look into that. Um, but the question I wanted to ask was building off a conversation we started to have, Martha, but this is really for the entire panel. With the increasing emphasis on supporting environmental justice with these financing tools, how do we ensure that those uh, communities or pockets within a community that qualify for environmental justice funding, but may be part of a large municipality or region that does not qualify, how do we ensure that they are getting the resources that they need? Nice, easy question. <laughs> we talked about this when we were sitting together, and they're really, it's really hard because, you know, we're supposed to be helping underrepresented, low capacity environmental justice communities. That's really hard to identify because a municipality may not be identified as that. There may be only pockets of communities within that municipality. And so it's really hard to find those communities and it's really hard to justify to your sponsor, the grant maker, that this community qualifies as an EJ community. So I don't have an answer to that. I guess I guess what I have is like, uh, it's going to be really, really hard. <laughs> and every state does it differently. That's the other hard part. And then can I just add something about the workforce development piece? I don't want to be the Eeyore in the room or anything like that. You mentioned some great um, resources, and I agree, those are wonderful resources, but there's so much more needed in terms of getting youth involved in uh, work that is related to like green infrastructure maintenance, becoming water treatment operators or wastewater treatment operators. And that should start in high school, in the technical high schools, also in the community colleges. And, it's not that hard to solve. It's just like nobody's done it though. And um, there are grants for workforce development. It's just something that just hasn't been done that really needs to be done. And does anybody want to speak to social vulnerability, environmental justice, and the community resilience partnership? Sure. I mean, I'll just say <laughs> Another complicated factor is that every federal agency has different mapping tools to use to identify and different criteria for identifying environmental justice communities. So that is a challenge and they're not necessarily overlapping all the time. Um, I think one of the approaches that we have come to, and I don't know, this doesn't always line up with funding sources, but just thinking more broadly and slightly differently about what environmental justice looks like in Maine, which is it does not going to look the same as it does in Massachusetts, 
um, or in other states. So I do think that there's sort of like an on the ground reality that one, we don't have great data sources. And we send this information is terrible and it doesn't necessarily align with what's happening in communities. So what we try to do is like get a little closer to the ground, try and encourage municipalities to partner with community-based organizations and improve on the data so we can tell a better story at a regional level about what's happening and where it's happening. And so I think that is how we're trying to at least get around it. It's not solving anything necessarily. It doesn't address some of the, the structural issues, but at least we can start to get a better sense of what does our community really look like and what challenges are um, our certain demographics facing. So just a plug for getting better data, at least. And I could I just go add a little something to that, is that our approach to working with EJ communities is that we're going to be working with groups that know the EJ communities and have the inroads with EJ communities so that a stranger like us doesn't come and say, hey, we're here to help you, and they don't know who we are. We're also going to be, um, we put, we set aside some funds to actually pay community members to come to meetings and to do um, listening sessions and um, just so that they show up and that they know that they're valued and, and that it's not just free time and we will provide like child care and things like that. So that's part of our program. With the community development block grant program, sorry, with infrastructure funding, they would actually have you go out and survey the users. So if you're looking at public water, who is on that public water line, and you do survey, you do survey just those people because they're the ones who are benefiting from the program. So then you know what your actual income, you know, if you if they meet low to moderate income or whatever your your EJ requirements might be. Um, anyway, so just a thought. Okay, great. Thanks for that. So we, uh, Lucy said we're at time for the questions and answers. So thank you for participating. Resources. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank um, everybody who is here representing an agency or an organization that could provide resources and technical assistance. Um, what came through for me, both in working with our speakers um, to put the, the conference together and then just listening to everybody today, was this additional layer of community engagement, community involvement, listening to your communities and being responsive to them through planning processes, through intentional outreach, um, through grassroots efforts. Uh, that came through to me loud and clear on every single panel today. I hope you heard it too and are bringing back examples of how you might do that kind of work, incorporate that kind of work into the projects in your community as well. So I wanna just thank the speakers for really stepping into that community engagement space as well um, and inspiring us at GoPIF, but hopefully also you as well to, to do more of that work and to do it at a high level. So thank you. And then um, Gabe made a really good plug at the end of the, uh, during the Q&A about the regional coordinator. So as enrolled communities in the Community Resilience Partnership, you have access to the regional coordinator in your region. And if you need help finding them, talk to me, we'll get you connected. And those regional coordinators can help you research funding opportunities and technical assistance. And in some cases they can help, they can provide that technical assistance and that grant writing assistance to you. So reach out to your regional coordinators. There was a great question about communities just not having the capacity to even absorb the opportunities that are coming at them. That's what the regional coordinators are there for. Um, so take advantage of that, get connected to your regional coordinator or reach out to us and we'll get you connected. Yeah, we did that. All right. Um, because the Community Resilience Partnership is growing, we have been adding new staff to GoPIF. So I want to introduce um, Ashley and Molly. And if you could both stand up, that would be great. Ashley will be uh, is the new program manager for the Community Resilience Partnership, and you will start hearing more and more from her over the coming weeks and months. Um, so we're really excited to have new capacity at GoPIF um, to help 
us run this program that has been growing really fast um, and is doing great work. So thank you all for the success that is making us up our game and bring Ashley on board. Uh, Molly Siegel is joining us as the main uh, Climate Council coordinator. So for those of you who are, who are involved in the Climate Council itself, you will be hearing a lot more from Molly over the coming months as that process kicks into gear again for the next four-year planning cycle. So welcome to both Molly and Ashley. So where is the Community Resilience Partnership today? Uh, we are at 140 communities that are participating. 104 of those are fully enrolled and eligible for grants, and the remaining are working on their enrollments with our service providers. Um, so this is great. We had a goal of having 100 communities participating in the first year, and we are one year plus in now with 140 communities. So thank you to all of you, either as communities who have stepped up and stepped into this program to do the work, for the service providers who are here who are supporting you, for the regional coordinators who are supporting the program. This is really a partnership. It couldn't happen without all of you here. Um, so thank you for the success. And you can see our stats from 2000, uh, 2022 there. We got a lot of money out the door to a lot of communities and we're looking forward to a, a great 2023. Without further ado, this is why you all came today, right? <laughs> so uh, the spring 2023 round is open for both service provider grants and for uh, community action grants. You can see on the um, board there, and then you have these flyers at your table. So please take one of these. There's a QR code on this flyer. If you scan it with your phone, we'll take you to the Community Resilience Partnership website where you will find a great number of things, including a link to the state procurement website, which will take you to the application forms and the RFA documents for these two grants. Also, we will post the slides from today on the, the website. Look for those um, probably starting tomorrow. And then uh, sometime in the next week or two, we will post the recording from this workshop today or for this conference today. Um, so if you wanna go back and listen to any of the speakers and say, what did they really say about that? you'll be able to go back to the recording. So all of that will be on the Community Resilience Partnership website. And all of that will help you think about your grant applications. Um, and so for the service provider grants, and again, these are grants to organizations that help communities get in, enrolled in the partnership and apply for their first grant. So are there any communities here actually who have not yet enrolled in the partnership, haven't started the process, but you're here to learn? A couple, great, excellent, welcome. Can I ask what communities you're from? No. Great, where are my service providers? Yeah, those are your people. <laughs> All right, um, so get connected before you leave today with a service provider if you need some assistance um, because they will be looking for communities to recruit into their service provider grants. The deadline for the service provider grant is June 23rd. So you've got about seven weeks to prepare for that. Um, and then on the community action grant side, we've got enrolled communities in the room who will be eligible for the community action grants. Uh, your deadline is July 7th, so you've got about nine weeks if my math is correct there. For both of these programs, we're going to be doing informational webinars on June 1st. At one o'clock, we'll cover the service provider grant, and at three o'clock, we'll cover the community action grant. So join us for those webinars. If you cannot make it, we will record it and post it um, so you can catch up with us afterwards on that. Um, I believe that is all that I have on that. Take the flyer home. Uh, we'll be announcing more via newsletter. Actually, that should be in your inboxes as we speak. Um, so you can cover, you can get links and all of that um, in the newsletter in your box right now. If you are not getting the Community Resilience Partnership newsletter, go to the website and hit the subscribe button so that you do get it and you don't miss any announcements about grant deadlines and webinars and things like that. Rachel Lynn. Um, good question. There will be, as we planned it right now, uh, three rounds over the next two years. So we have the round uh, opening up right now. We expect another round uh, in the winter of 23, 24, and then another round later in 24. Yeah, about there. Yep. I saw another question over here. Excellent. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you for to the GoPIF staff for helping us put this on. This is a huge lift. And thank you to the University of Maine for hosting us and feeding us today and making all the tech work.